and just uh, remind members about your ongoing obligation to declare interest, uh, switching off mobiles, please, and also uh, to switch your tablet to a silent mode, please. I need to do that myself. Uh, FN key and then the F8 key. That's us. Yep. Uh, today's business, we have a briefing from the Commissioner for complaints on the local government bill, uh, a departmental briefing on the pre-consultation on the draft code of conduct for councillors, and a briefing by EU desk officer, and also one SL1 and one statutory route. So we have apologies from Pam Cameron. And I know Peter uh, is going to come slightly later than, uh, than the start of the meeting. Um, any other apologies, member? No. OK. Um, chairperson's business, um, nothing really. I had a meeting yesterday with the archaeologists. Um, the notes will be shared with members next week. OK. Uh, draft minutes, members, at page six. Members, are you content to agree the minutes? Okay, thank you. Uh, matters arising uh, at page 13. Uh, first one is departmental reply regarding uh, the sparrows <coughs> AONB. Uh, members had asked to be kept informed of progress on the formation of an AONB management body or the parents. So the department uh, has indicated that now uh, Draper's turn, partnership will receive a letter of offer of £100,000 uh, with certain provisos towards the employment of an AOMB officer to develop and implement an AOMB management plan. And uh, that, that's very good news. Um, we certainly would be, I think, quite keen to maybe to share the management plan, if they would keep us yeah. informed about uh -huh, about um, their plan and the progress as well. So, members, have any other comments? The, the, the name of that body, Sperrins. It's called the Draper's Turn Partnership. So, it's um, this is going to be like a management body. For the Sparrows AONB, they are really the only one that really hasn't got a member of staff or a trust or partnership to look at really conservation, protection of the area. It's a massive area, massive AONB. So they would be like a consultee for any planning applications in that area? No, oh no, no, don't. Th well, I, I suppose they would be. They would be a consultee, yeah, but they would be the one instigating, say, um, um, erosion, prevention of erosion of the land and yeah, protection of the area, species. And, yeah. so, and yeah, they would impact on perhaps I wind turbine too. I, to protect the AONB nature of the sparrows, you know, it seems to be there's a gap there in local bodies that are listened to by planning service. You know, I wonder could we do any inquiry? There used to be a sparrows tourism body. Mm -hmm. Maybe semi-statutory or statutory, mm -hmm. but uh, there is no such body now. It, it became defunct a couple of years ago. Okay. So, I suppose my question is, uh, maybe we should ask the Department of Environment: uh, Are there any statutory organisations in the Sparrows that they regularly consult on planning applications? They might be charged with tourism promotion or conservation or whatever. But who are these bodies, and do, you know, is there a gap? And would this new yeah. one be, be one yeah. of the consultees? Yeah, yeah. Thank Members you. agree with that? Right. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Any other comments? Happy with that? We'll move on. And next item is the uh, draft minutes from the subcommittee meeting on the 7th of January, and that's at page 14. That's the committee meeting with Nelger uh, to discuss the local government bill. I must say it was a very useful, very constructive uh, meeting. Quite a number of, uh, of members turned up for it too. So members, are you content to note the minutes of that meeting? Okay, thank you. Then next item is DOE work programme uh, to April 2014 at page 18 members. 
Um, the programme has a significant focus on the regulations uh, relating to the local government bill. Um, sounded quite a long list, <laughs> quite, a, quite a long list of um, regulations and guidances that uh, the OE will be issuing over the next few months. Members, any, any comments on this? Okay. The yeah, we could. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're, we're meeting the permanent secretary. What in February? In February, so on the beginning of February. So we could go over that with the permanent secretary. So and um, there's a lot of work still to come in relation to the local government bill. Uh, okay, members, we moved on then. Uh, next item is the examiner of statutory rules report at page 28. And the examiner draws attention to SR 2013 stroke 260, the controlled waste seizure of property regulations NI, on the ground that they are defectively drafted in one respect which has been acknowledged by the department. Uh, the examiner has not recommended any amendments to the rule. Um, we members, as I'm sure you remember, that have already written to the department to ask them to take more care in future in drafting statutory uh, rules, because we've seen a number now of really uh, silly, mirror, uh, silly, silly errors. Uh, appearing in them. Typing errors and that they have to to rectify and, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and come these, back to us. These silly errors, as you call them, been brought to their attention? Yes. Uh -huh. have, yeah. in that term. Sorry, what do you mean? I mean, have you gone to them and said, look, there are silly errors here. Yeah. Uh, we don't expect to see these silly errors being reported. Is that the way it's been delivered to them? The examiner yeah, has much, highlighted yeah. typographical errors. Yes. Yeah. Did yeah. use the word silly? No, no, I used right. it. <laughs> no, 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 just me. Sorry. You've got a code and I've got a code. I couldn't hear you properly. <laughs> oh, I know. I'm, st I'm, I'm starting. I'm starting on it. Yes. Right. Uh, sorry. Next item. Um, Yes, um, so members, are you are you content to note? Yeah, yeah. Next item is on um, the Northern Ireland Audit Office reply regarding a local government bill. Uh, members, it's um, yeah put into your pack, but apparently it's been encrypted and you can't open it. So members, it's a table paper with you uh, on your desk there. Um, so we, we had asked the Audit Office to estimate costs of the performance improvements regime if the bill proceeds as drafted or alternatively if it is amended to take account of changes proposed by the Audit Office. Um, its estimated costs would be around 500,000 if the bill uh, proceeds as drafted. Uh, if the bill is amended as the Audit Office has, uh, um, let's see, if the bill is amended, the Audit Office has estimated that costs could be reduced by up to 35% uh, after the first few years, uh, equating to around 175,000 per annum. So, members, are you content to note? Any, any comments on this? Content. content. Yep, yep, yep. That's quite a uh, Quite a sizable drop, you know, in the expenditure. Yeah. Um, next item at page 35, members, that uh, consultation on secondary legislation relating to the HGV Road User Levy Act 2013. Uh, this act introduces a charge to be paid by both UK and foreign registered HGVs weighing 12 tonnes or more which use the UK road network, the department is required to amend Northern Ireland legislation to enable implementation of the provisions of the Act. 
the HGV road user levy scheme is due to start uh, in April this year. Members, uh, are you content to request a copy of the synopsis of responses? Just to occur, I, mean, I have concerns about this here levy and how it impacts on polyers. Um, I know we've got some response from this. Is there a chance of getting a briefing on this here that clearly defined exactly what's, what, will, uh, what the impact will be on this here? I mean, I'd just like a briefing to say exactly what, what the proposals are. It's not going to have any negative impact, is that right? No. They pay so, the money well, and then <laughs> they get the money's the, returned. The the money bill has, yeah, yeah. has negatives and positives, but I yeah, mean, if sure. we have time, I would appreciate yeah, or absolutely. one member from every party, but I'd like a briefing to see exactly yeah. how this will impact. I mean, I agree with Carl has said. Uh, this is a deposit. Right? Yes. Yeah. And then Why is there a need for a deposit? Yeah. It yeah. seems to me, if you, you, if you pay this deposit and then it's returned to you, what's, yeah. it, it seems to me some sort of bureaucratic yeah. nonsense, Absolutely. you know. But anyway, I'm sure yeah. all will be clarified. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably EU bureaucracy, <laughs> I'm afraid. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah, we'll do that. Good idea. Yep. Uh, next item. Uh, it's an SL1 members, uh, that's taxi meters and minimum fare at page 56. The proposed rule will set out the structure and level of the maximum fare tariff, require uh, specified classes of taxi to have a taxi meter and receipt printer uh, fitted, make provision for the manner of use of the taxi meter make provision for the annual testing, calibrating and sealing of taxi meters and require in scope um, taxis to have a for hire sign fitted. The cost of purchase and fitment of a taxi meter and a receipt printer is likely to be around £220 uh, pounds and £200 pounds respectively. In order to mitigate the impact of this cause, the requirement to have the taxi meter fitted and in use will be derogated until the 1st of March 2015 and the requirement to have a receipt printer until 1st of January uh, 2016, two years from now. Uh, it is proposed that the rule will come into operation on the 1st of September 2014. So, members, are you content for the department to proceed in making the route? I have Cahill here. Yep. Yep. I'm not content today. I, I would like a deferral in this matter. Um, there are outstanding issues that we have dealt with in relation to uh, departmental officials that they were come back to. We have met We have met with them, sorry, and they were to come back with us. So, I, I would ask support for this to be deferred to find out exactly uh, what the issues in relation to the single tier are. In principle, I have no objection to some of this here, but certainly in relation to some of the questions we have asked, I would prefer that we defer this to, be, to the Department of Fish to come back to us. A lot more of you yeah. like to come yes. in? There are other issues too that I would like to hear and know a wee bit more about. I would not be content to uh, give this the uh, green light today, and I think it should be held uh, for a short period. Okay. And we'll, we'll do that. Members content with that? Yeah. 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 We uh, chased up the response from the, uh, the queries we put to the officials at that meeting uh, with, with, the, with the policy division. Yeah. Okay, members. Yeah. And next item, uh, members, is. At page 60, uh, that's an SR, uh, the Motor Vehicles Driving Licenses Amendment Number 2 Regulations, NI 2013. These regulations amend the Motor Vehicles Driving Licenses Regulations 1996 in order to accommodate the requirements of Directive 2012, Stroke 36, Stroke EU of the European Parliament in relation to driving licences and tests. The uh, committee considered the SL1 for this route on the 12th of December last year, and we were content 
for the department to make the rule. Uh, the rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure and came into operation on the 31st December 2013. Um, can I put the members now at the Committee for the Environment has considered SR 2013-298, stroke the Motor Vehicle Striving Licenses Amendment No. 2 Regulations NI 2013, and has no objection to the rule. Uh, we have also now uh, received um, the comments uh, on, from the examiner uh, of, of statutory rules, and he has no comment on, on this rule. Okay, members, are you content to look uh, or to, to agree? Great, yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, next item, uh, Commissioner for Complaints Briefing on the Local Government Bill. Uh, members, you have been provided with the briefing paper at page 74, and you also uh, have a tabled paper from Nelgar uh, with their suggestion for an appeal uh, mechanism. Uh, if I may uh, welcome uh, Mr. I think it's Doctor, is that right? Doctor, not Mr. Dr. Tom Frawley, uh, Marie Anderson, and Gillian Coy. You're very, very welcome. And um, so we certainly have received a lot of written uh, uh, submissions and in relation to. Obviously, the code of conduct and and, uh, and a, a lot of issues on, on, on complaints and all this. So we look forward to your briefing, uh, Dr. Crawley. Thank you, uh, Chairman and, and committee members. Uh, with your permission, I just maybe if I could uh, make some opening remarks to to set the scene from my perspective. Um, can I, as I say, begin by thanking the committee for the opportunity to give evidence this morning on the proposed role of the Commissioner for Complaints in relation to the local government ethical standards regime uh, that is to be established under Part 9 of the Bill. I, for my part, very much welcome the introduction of a mandatory code of conduct for councillors, which I consider to be an important part of the reform of local government in Northern Ireland. I'm conscious that with the inception of the new councils, we are embarking on a new era in which councillors will have an increasingly important role, particularly in regard to planning and community planning matters. In my view, these developments make it even more important that we ensure that the code, the first mandatory code for councillors in Northern Ireland, is effective and secures both the confidence and trust of the public in ethical standards in local government. There is, however, also a need to maintain a balance between ensuring the public interest being met, while also creating a regime that is fair to those individuals whose conduct is the subject of a complaint. I am aware that during the committee's scrutiny of the bill, a number of issues have been raised in relation to the proposal uh, that the Commissioner will be involved in ethical standards. It is my understanding that these include the procedures by which complaints of alleged breaches of the Code will be investigated and adjudicated on, whether the scope of the Code and my related jurisdiction should be wider than that currently proposed in the bill, the need for an appeal mechanism, the means by which complaints of a more minor nature might be handled, and how unfounded allegations will be dealt with. The written paper I have submitted to the Committee gives an overview of my proposed role within the ethical standards from my perspective uh, in terms of investigation and adjudication procedures and it also provides some clarity in relation to the scope of the Code as it is currently drafted. Before moving to respond to the Committee questions on these and any other matters, I would highlight the provision in the Bill for the extension of some of the provisions of the Commissioner for Complaints Northern Ireland Order 1996 to apply to the investigation of local government ethical standards complaints. I consider it essential that the principles already established within the existing areas of my jurisdiction are built upon within the ethical standards regime and that the model that has operated successfully in the Commissioner for Complaints jurisdiction since 1969 is not compromised. I am happy to take questions from the committee. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, it's only, you mentioned uh, a number of issues uh, rising from uh, 
from the uh, coming from the written submissions, one of which a very frequent one is about the lack of appeal mechanism. Now we've just received, as I said earlier, a tabled a paper from Neogar. Um, maybe if I can allow members a couple of minutes quickly to read through that, I would very much like you to maybe respond to to the issue of appeal uh, or the lack of it. Um, so, if you don't mind, if we have a couple of minutes for members to. Okay. Oh. Okay. At page six, members in your table pack. Um, so, uh, it listed here uh, practices in other jurisdictions um, that in Scotland, uh, you know, listed you know, reasons for the appeal, um, you know, and also, um, yeah, they, let me see, it says it can go in Scotland, it can go to uh, something uh, to a sheriff principle, which uh, in this instance uh, in Northern Ireland perhaps would be uh, would be uh, the county court. Yeah, and in Wales um, it says they have the public services ombudsman. Yeah. Uh, so it's equivalent to yourself. Uh, but there is a, a judici uh, an adjudication panel, which is independ uh, an independent body, yeah. and looks like it, it can also then uh, the panel's rule is to form tribunals to consider whether elected members or co-opted members of county can county borough and community councils, police, fire and national park authorities in Wales have breached this, um, uh, the authority statutory code of conduct. Um, this panel will also hear appeals by members. So we don't have that here, it's saying. Um, I think that, Chairman, if, if it might be helpful from that preliminary commentary you've offered me that that we would maybe look at those alternative jurisdictions and how they deal with it because clearly I think it might be helpful for the committee to understand well what is the difference in Scotland what is the difference in Wales and what are we proposing to do and then having opened up the discussion in that way we could possibly then explore the model here uh, that, that, that we would speak to and you can make your own judgment on that Yes. Um, I, I myself, uh, Chairman, have looked to my deputy, Marie Anderson, uh, particularly as a qualified and practicing lawyer, to look at these issues, because I think there are obviously legal issues very fundamentally involved, and also to look at the comparative models across the, uh, these islands in terms of the devolved uh, territory, so-called. And so if you would uh, allow her to speak to the subject, and then we can join in as you find helpful. Chair, would it be helpful if I dealt with a comparison with the other jurisdictions first? Yes, please. Before I deal with appeal versus JR. 
Um, in the other jurisdictions, the model is completely different from that which is proposed by Part 9 of the Local Government Bill. Uh, in Scotland and in, um, and in Wales in particular, um, the role of the Standards Commissioner or the, the Ombudsman is to simply investigate and then there is an appeal mechanism from that decision. If I take in particular the position in Wales, because it's probably closest in terms of our own, um, the Public Service Ombudsman for Wales investigates complaints of maladministration about public bodies and also investigates complaints about the standards and, and, and behaviour of, of local um, authority um, councillors and members. Now, the position is that the Welsh Ombudsman simply investigates and that the adjudicating panel that you have mentioned, that it, and I think I haven't seen the Nilgo paper, but um, the adjudicating panel for Wales adjudicates. So the model is different. The model that is proposed here in Northern Ireland is for the Commissioner for Complaints for Northern Ireland to both investigate a complaint and adjudicate on sanction. So it is a different model. And if I take you particularly to the Welsh model, I have had the benefit of visiting Wales, seeing how they investigate and meeting actually with Peter Davis, who is the chair and president of the adjudicating panel for Wales. They actually impose the sanctions. In Northern Ireland, the Commissioner for Complaints is both investigator and adjudicator, so it is a different model. In effect, we have tied the role of the Public Service Ombudsman for Wales and the role of the adjudicating panel for Wales into one office. Um, a number of reasons for that. Primarily, I, I think one of, one of the significant reasons is actually the saving of costs, because the model as previously uh, proposed, which would have had an appellate tier, um, would have cost, and, and standards committees and councils, would have cost in the reach in excess of £850,000. In effect, the Commissioner for Complaints is combining both role of investigator and adjudicator for something in excess of £300,000 per annum. So there is a cost saving. Nevertheless, I think if, if I actually take you to the issue of what would be an appropriate method of challenging the Commissioner for Complaints decisions on investigation and adjudication, that might be helpful because I think it's important um, for the councillors who are the subject of a complaint to understand that the process will be fair, transparent and will provide opportunities for representation. I think back to uh, what the Commissioner for Complaints has said in his opening remarks, it is important to remember that this function of investigation and adjudication of local government standards will sit within our Commissioner for Complaints jurisdiction and currently um, the Commissioner for Complaints decisions are only amenable to challenge by way of judicial review. We have sought senior counsel's opinion on this matter and we have been advised that this arrangement reflects the constitutional pos position of the Commissioner who sits in parallel to other aspects of the justice system and it would be important to maintain that consistency with the Commissioner for Complaints jurisdiction and that it would be uh, inappropriate that there would be an appeal from a Commissioner for Complaints decision either on maladministration or on an issue regarding breach of the Code of Conduct. So that it is, it is quite significant, this point. I am aware from looking at some of the debates that, that there have been a, there's been a concern about fairness in the process, and there has also been a concern that judicial review merely looks at the process of decision-making and is not an appropriate method to open up challenge to the decision of the Commissioner on sanction, for instance. Can I reassure the committee that that is not the case? Judicial review has been described as the principal legal procedure by which public power is defined, invoked and restrained. And it includes an examination of process and the legality and fairness and proportionality of a decision. I think it's also important to note that if judicial review were available as proposed in order to challenge a commissioner's decision, that there's an important uh, element to judicial review that may not be there in an appeal and that is the fact that the first stage is a leave application to a high court judge to, to, to look at the merits of the decision to see if there's prima facie evidence and this is helpful not only in terms of the parties providing them with an opportunity to look again at a decision and, and perhaps seek to resolve it but it also means that unmeritorious challenges either from a complainant or a counsellor could could not be granted leave and will go no further and that 
might be a significant saving in legal costs to the public purse overall. I think the other thing that it does bring into play, Ch Chairman, to be fair, and I thank Marie for that very helpful, I think, uh, perspective, is that you also have the authority of a High Court judge making the judgment as to whether the Commissioner has act acted fairly or not. And finally, I would say this. The irony of the circumstance, even if you have uh, an appeal mechanism, those issues where the individuals are not happy with the appeal will go to judicial review, um, and because that's what people do. Um, people are not willing to accept uh, the outcome of an appeal. They will just go to judicial review. And uh, two other dimensions to it. <clears throat> the appeal issue, by its nature, is extremely expensive because all parties will want legal representation. And I, w I don't want to say this because you know this better than I. Everyone will look for the public purse to support that legal representation. You, in designing the legislation, will be asked to indemnify councillors who will th therefore have an open access to public money in terms of their challenge. Obviously, my office is funded by public money. Um, and indeed, the complainant might well argue that equality of arms demands that they too have access to public money and, and all of that into an appeal process. Now, all, I make the point that the word appeal uh, is left there. I think if Marie would just describe the process, Chairman, and bear with us, and you may have questions already that you want to push or, or press, but just, I think, to give you a sense of how the decision-making process would work in our view, you'll get a sense of the different levels of engagement and the different levels of opportunity that, afford an that are going to be afforded to an individual to actually speak to their defense or to challenge an allegation made against them are quite significant within the process we pr propose. So that, in turn, will allow you make a judgment about how far is the individual able to articulate their own position and challenge the allegation made against them. Would you find that helpful, Chair, if yes. I explain? Yes, I, members. I, I might caveat yeah. this, that, yes. that this is still work in progress. We are working on the procedures and as part for investigation and adjudication in the office. And, and those procedures will be tested both by uh, getting an opinion of a senior counsel who's a judicial review practitioner to ensure that there's fairness and that the rules of natural justice are met, as well as any obligations under the European Convention of Human Rights. And under an SLA with the Human Rights Commission, we can obtain advice about our process and it's meeting human rights and data protection obligations, and we intend to take that step also. So if you like, our procedures are going to be human rights proofed and proofed in terms of fairness and, 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 and transparency and open, openness. Um, if I just go to the first I think quite significant fact is that the bill provides that only a complaint in writing can be accepted by the commissioner and I think that's quite important. The commissioner will not be accepting anonymous complaints. The individual must put their complaint in writing. Um, as part of our consideration of what this process might look like. It, there is within the bill a discretion on the part of the Commissioner as to how to investigate or proceed in an investigation. An important part we think of that process will be an admissibility stage so that we will <coughs> consider whether a complaint has been properly brought to the Commissioner is a matter that is in, within jurisdiction. In other words, you're not complaining about this individual in their role as an MLA or otherwise, and that there will be consideration given as to whether the complaint is of a minor nature or it should actually proceed to investigation. The councillor will, at that point in time, if it, there is a decision to proceed to investigation, be informed about the full details of the complaint and any evidence that has been provided by the complainant to support that complaint. And, and will be informed uh, of the Commissioner's decision in relation to an investigation. Now, once an investigation starts, um, of course the complainant will have to be interviewed, perhaps, and the councillor. And, and the councillor will be given an, a, 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 an ability to have someone in support in relation to any interviews with the Commissioner or his staff, so that there will be an opportunity to make the representations during the investigation stage. I think it's important that the way the bill is framed, um, 
there is not there is a there is a middle <coughs> procedure that needs to be undertaken and that is that the, the bill quite rightly um, provides for circumstances where there is no evidence of a breach and in those circumstances where there is no evidence of any breach of the code no further action will be taken by the commissioner uh, so there is there is a provision that relates to the findings that the commissioner can can, can make, and that is one of them, that there is no evidence of a breach. And I think that's important for an individual who's been accused uh, to know that, that, the, you know, that the, the, there is a rigorous process to test the evidence. The next stage really is the, in, in terms of the investigation, may well involve taking statements from eyewitnesses in relation to a particular incident or looking at documents, and, and there will be procedures and processes around that. I think it's important to note that the, um, in terms of adjudication, which is the next stage, the commissioner will make the decision on sanction to be imposed. So that is a commissioner decision. Uh, internally, we have established a directorate of investigations so that those who lead on the investigation will actually sign off on the investigation report. And there will be, uh, if you like, a Chinese wall between the investigator and the commissioner who makes the decision on, it, on, on, on sanction. So there is that. There is going to be you know, a careful, uh, if you like, dichotomy or difference between the investigation and the decisions on sanction. And at the stage where the commissioner is considering whether to impose sanction or not, that can be censure, suspension or disqualification the individual, the councillor, will be given an opportunity uh, to bring representations either on their own behalf or through legal representatives in relation to the issues raised in the investigation and raised by the, on the issue of sanction. So that is, you know, we, we have a three-stage process in effect, admissibility, investigation and adjudication. And how transparent is the whole process? Say, are you going to publish your investigation, you know, or you know whether it's admissible or not admissible, would you be you know, letting the public know? One of the merits, Chairman, of our um, of using the model of the Commissioner for standards, sorry, of, of complaint for complaints, is that we do everything in private. I mean, I think that's very important to us. Um, uh, the confidentiality dimension is hugely important. I mean, clearly. There is, and I think this has been again highlighted in your own discussions, the risk that an individual while complaining will also go to the local media and say, well, of course, I've made a complaint today to the Commissioner for Standards uh, because I, you know, the, the, the representatives in this room understand how this works better than I do. Um, I think in that circumstance, then, I think a very clear judgment would have to be made that in the event that the allegation is put into the public uh, space, then clearly the vindication has to be in the public space. So it would not be a private answer saying, well, I find no case to answer. I think if it's in the public arena, then the commissioner would be compelled to go into the public arena and say I had that, that allegation had no basis whatever. Secondly, I think it's important to be very clear to, to everyone affected by this code that if people make malicious complaints and they're found to be malicious and judged to be so by the commissioner, then they in turn are, may, are breaching the code and they and then are liable to an investigation and that would be a judgment that the commissioner would make as to whether your behavior, uh, the way you've dealt with this issue in itself a breach of the code. Um, so I think that throughout this uh, confidentiality is important but uh, clearly that would be guided by and informed by whether the individual pursuing a complaint has behaved properly in that circumstance and as I've tried to suggest chairman then there are other interventions that might be appropriate if their behavior is inappropriate that's a good balance in many ways rather than you know, that ready to safeguard people bringing in frivolous complaints and yeah. without prejudging any matter um, and one of the benefits of uh, adding this function to the commissioner for complaints legislation as it exists is that the commissioner has the benefit of the obstruction and contempt provisions in that order, which, which would allow him, if he thought that any person was contemptuous uh, of his process, which might well include going into the public domain with an unfounded and uninvestigated allegation about an individual, and if they, you know, the damage of the reputation to that individual, then there is a provision that will allow the commissioner to certify
certify to the High Court a matter of contempt. Now, that's not a decision he would take lightly, but you could see that already there is a protection there for individuals who may be the subject of unfounded or malicious allegations, and I think that's an important protection. And again, it feeds back into our desire, which is to, as far as possible, not only provide the protections of the 96 legislation under which we currently operate to, to, to the individuals, but also to ensure that the Commissioner's constitutional position under that legislation is also protected. Any other question? A uh, question. Um, you'd be well aware of, of, of how this thing is used up here. Um, it becomes a political football. Um, sometimes around, uh, particularly around last summer, we had a lot of complaints. Um, I'm sure coming up to the ne next election there will be a few more complaints. Um, and the vast majority of them don't go anywhere. Um, so I understand, I think you have a lot of protections in there around confidentiality, but I, I think it should be a rule that you shouldn't be allowed, if you're a complainant, to put it into the public domain at all. Uh, you just shouldn't be allowed, whether it's malicious or not. Um, and the only thing that should ever be put into the public domain is if someone's actually found guilty of something. Um, because in a political arena, it just becomes uh, used as, uh, as part of a, a political campaign against an individual. Um, uh, and we've seen it far too often up here, and we're, we're grappling with this in the Standards and Privileges Committee, uh, and it's not all that easy, but I, I think you need to make as much provision to protect uh, the person who's being complained against. Um, I, I just think that that would be a good thing. It's good that people can be uh, found of guilty of, 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 of making malicious complaints, but I don't think anyone should be allowed to, to put anything in the public domain until the results uh, are, 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 are investigated and, 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 and made. That, may, I, may I answer that point? Because um, we have sought legal advice in relation to our work under uh, investigation of complaints of maladministration where complainants or even public bodies have taken our report or a draft or a report, draft report and gone into the public domain in it, with it, and we are told that that is contempt. So you know, I think I think there are existing provisions. They they apply equally to complainant and counsellor. So we have sought advice on that in in the other aspect of our work. Just adding to that, Chairman, to to Mr. Eastwood, through you, I think the point I would make is this, that. We, we would wish the spirit to be one of confidentiality and privacy. We believe people are entitled to that. But you are the public representatives, and there's a dimension to the whole issue of, and it was your word, not mine, transparency and openness. Uh, and and there, is a, there is a tension there between that transparency, openness, and absolute confidentiality. So uh, let me be clear, the issue would be that once the matter was published, the judgment would have to lie with the commissioner as to the nature of the finding and whether that finding demanded to be in the public space because of its significance or the implication of it across. Now, that's a judgment called by the commissioner. So there are issues which would go into the public arena. I think the, 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 the pitch of Mr. Eastwood's point, however, is that just using the complaint itself as a vehicle for gaining traction and visibility. Uh, and once you've got the traction and the visibility, the outcome doesn't matter at all. That's his point. Mm. And, I, and I take that point entirely. Sticks. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But I think the other side of that, and I, and I will have a, a cheap shot at, at politicians in that sense, so, so much of that is dependent on yourselves, if I may say so. Uh, so I, I, I mean, I'm happy. I don't wish to present myself going forward as the referee, so to speak, in the middle of this. But at the end of the day, if the players accept the spirit of the process, then it is much easier to referee the match. So I, I really make the point that it is a very difficult arena. There, is, there are real issues about openness and transparency, and you would advocate those very strongly about uh, you know, executive departments and others and public bodies. And so we have to find that balance. I think it's not to be naive either, Chair, because I think Mr Eastwood's point is properly made, is that the experience in Wales, we are told, is that at election time, complaints to the Welsh Ombudsman more than double. Yes. Well, we'll be seeing that in the coming months, <laughs> coming years and coming months. Uh, I have Cahill first. Yes. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much for the presentation. I'm not going to comment on what you said about the politician after. 
but uh, just a couple of uh, key issues there. And I do welcome the point brought up by um, Mr. Eastwood in relation to that matter. Because I think people they should get a fair hearing and should be confidential. Because I think once it goes out into the public domain, the perception is that you don't get a fair hearing. But I just want to pick up on I think it's important part is actually this issue about the admissibility criteria. And I mean, is that has that been set yet, or have you any ideas in relation to? Well, no, the admissibility criteria has not been set yet. What, what we have been able to do is to scope um, those complaints that we think we will not um, uh, accept for investigation under the code. Those would be cases where the, um, the individual had not put the complaint in writing, had merely telephoned the office. There would be circumstances where it is an anonymous complaint. There would be circumstances where there is no evidence to support the complaint. I think it's not mere, this is not merely about raising an allegation. What we intend to do is to have on our website and available in paper form a complaint form which says, please outline in detail the nature of the allegation and please provide supporting evidence documentation to support it. It is not simply that we will accept the complaint, immediately admit it and then commence an investigation. We will be looking at the evidence and we will be assessing the evidence. Perhaps admissibility is not the right word. Assessment might be a, a better word to describe that initial part of the process. And, and I think that that is important. Um, Obviously, any of our procedures will be put in the public domain. I think the intention is, I know the officials are here today, that, that, that when the code is finalised and our procedures are finalised and we begin to work on the guidance, that there will be some stakeholder events at which we will communicate to the councillor community and to others just what our procedures are in detail. Oh, so, and, and the reason, and the the, reason I was sorry, just to because in the past there has been issues with the recording of minutes and evidence. And I mean, we don't want to go down that route. You know what I mean? We need to cut that out from the start. We need a proper base, proper criteria, proper investigations. Yeah, I, think, I think we, we would feel that very clearly. Uh, to, again, to you, Chairman, to Mr. Boyle, and that's very much our focus. The other thing, it's very hard to finalise the admissibility criteria until the code is finalised and accepted, because that will hugely inform. The, the, the key criteria that you would wish it to have uh, in terms of that admissibility phase of the process. So there, there's a lot of work to be done uh, and uh, we're very conscious and it's very helpful to get the perspective of the committee on what are your concerns and priorities at this moment. Um, just following on actually from the bill itself in terms of clause 67 is the expenditure of the commissioner. Can you touch a wee bit on that? In, in well, to... uh, again, this is... Uh, the referee now becomes a sort of a player on the pitch as I try to protect my... I think the one thing I want to say, Chairman, if I might begin with, um, I think our office uh, is very clear that we have to provide value for money. Um, and uh, we currently have our core businesses investigating complaints. And I want to put on the record, and it is an opportunity to do so, and I thank Mr. Boylan for it. We will not compromise our core business, i.e. by investigating the complaints of people, by in some way cross-subsidizing the, the, the work of, of, of the code, the role of our code of conduct. So we will be very honest about what we believe this, the, the cost of this. I think Maria has already given you two ballpark numbers. The projected cost of the original proposals, which was in excess of £900,000, and what we are now talking about is a sum in the region of £300,000. Um, and the cost of that, Marie has been working on for me in terms of the, the sort of skills and resources and competencies that we believe we would need to deliver both on the, the mechanics of the process and the, the spirit of the process that we've been describing this morning. And I'll ask her just to speak to those core costs and that will give you, I hope, a sense of what we're talking about currently. I think we mentioned earlier the um we mentioned earlier the establishment of a directorate of standards, which will be led by, um, in civil service terms, a grade seven director. There will be two deputy principal officers and a staff officer and administrative support. And when we cost that out, and it is fully operational, obviously it's not fully operational at the moment because the actual regime hasn't started, the code isn't in play as yet. But when we start to, to, to get complaints in, investigate them, we think that 
it will probably fully functional will be in cost will be in the region of 375,000. To, to go back to um, the um, uh, Mr. Boylan's point, Article 67, as it stands, we are not happy with because it suggests it, and I, 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 I don't think it's the intention, but it, it certainly looks as if um, there's a, a kind of a polluter pays principle that councils, you know, will be charged by the commissioner for the number of complaints that they receive and that it will then be a matter for the Commissioner, um, if you like, to recover that amount as a debt. I think it's a debt recoverable. We don't think that's appropriate. We think that undermines, again, our role in relation to Commissioner for Complaints because, um, as this committee may know, we investigate complaints of maladministration about councils under maladministration, uh, under the maladministration function, and that is funded from uh, through the estimates process, and that is, the, that is um, essential to our independence. We think that a member of the public reading Article 67 might well say, well, you know, you are paid by the Council Commissioner to investigate these complaints, and there would be some perception of lack of independence. Therefore, I, I think w what we are proposing, or what is proposed, we've had discussions with the officials, is that in some way the local government grant will be top sliced in order to fund this activity. Um, uh, for the Commissioner, because I don't think it's appropriate the Commissioner starts sending out bills and collecting debts. Well, I mean, I would be totally opposed to it, let me say. I just don't think it's a model that makes any sense at this moment in time, and it, as Marie says, would compromise our independence. There is another issue that we shouldn't underestimate, Chairman, <clears throat> and it's very real and, and very uh, imminent, and it is certainly an issue in Wales uh, and Scotland uh, and England and indeed in the Republic of Ireland, and that is legal costs. One of the real issues around all of this is you can up front say £390,000, but the reality is if you then get into judicial reviews or you get into um, uh, representation where, where people have been identified, those costs will escalate very, very rapidly. And uh, I mean, I don't want to in any way um, burden you too much, but you know, a judicial review can be a very expensive process. Um, now, no one can predict what those will be like, um, but once you indemnify people, they will immediately take up the option. They won't say, well, this is coming out of the public purse, I'm not going to seek that support or, or cover. And so when you make a judgment, if you do, as you prepare this legislation and decide on it to indemnify people, then you are signing a blank check in terms of what lies ahead of us. Now, that's your judgment. It isn't mine. I'm just highlighting that that's the risk. Secondly, there is a real issue, and Marie is the one who reminds me of it as my sort of human rights conscience. And the quality of arms would demand that if you fund and indemnify a councillor, then you also should fund and indemnify the person making the complaint or else all the councillor has to do is say, well, I'm going to judicial review, the whole thing falls. So there are big issues in that for you that I am not in a position to give you a direction on, but I think I've made my position clear as you make those calls and offer advice to the Assembly as it proceeds with this legislation. I think the concern would be that at present, given the pressures on the legal aid budget, um, and you know that it's overspent. Um, the, the question would be, if a councillor is going to be indemnified in order to cha challenge the councillor, the commissioner's decision, is a complainant going to have the benefit of legal aid from the public purse also to challenge the commissioner's decision, perhaps not to investigate or not to impose sanction where they are unhappy about the outcome of an investigation? So that's where the equality of arms issue would come. Sorry, I Sorry, one final point. You shouldn't bring up a lot of issues yeah. there. <laughs> well, I had asked the question. Um, one final point, and, and I take it reading between the lines from what you said, it's the, the role is similar to the Ombudsman's role in terms of mild administration and all of that, and the sanctions. Um, just in relation to councils on outside bodies, when you're using it, you know, I mean, the likes of maybe neighbourhood renewal or something, if there's a decision made and there's an issue about it because they feel they're doing their part as part of the council, but there may be independent members on that. Well, I think there's two things I would say, Chairman, if I could, to, to Mr. Boyle, to you. First thing is, in the original review of my office <coughs> on, done by Deloitte in, in 2004, when the whole proposal for the office 
uh, to have uh, the, the, the conduct issue uh, placed in it. Uh, the original idea was that both the Assembly Commission uh, for Standards role and indeed Local Government Commissioner for Standards role would be located in the office, thus saving significant money. But you know, the Assembly decided it wanted its own commissioner and that's perfectly reasonable. The other part of the recommendation was that all public appointees to public bodies should be the subject of a code so that the code would apply equally to people who are members of, say, non-executive directors of trusts or board members appointed by ministers to education boards currently or to other bodies. So that would have brought an equality that is of concern, I know, to some councillors. Um, but, you know, again, the way the design has developed, uh, local government is taking its place now through the reform process. That issue hasn't been addressed. So while councillors will be going on to other bodies in representing their councils on those other bodies, they will be subject to the code in that role. The other people on those bodies will not be subject to the code. Um, now, equally, if the bodies that they are if you like, nominated to or appointed to by the council, <clears throat> don't have a code, then equally the code uh, for local councillors will apply in that circumstance. And that would be for the other members appointed to those bodies, not the... No, it, it would uh, be... Not, not just the, the council. Absolutely, yes. Okay, Carl. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, Thank Thank you, Chair. Thank you to uh, those who have spoken. I found, found this. Um, I'm glad I'm not a councillor anymore. Uh, <laughs> even have to do. I've just spent 40 years, and I think I've just escaped. Uh, there's a number of issues that I'd like to hear you comment on, and um, it, it strikes me that maybe what's down ahead of us is a sort of a lawyer's paradise, uh, because uh, you're going to have uh, real good times if the. Uh, if the worst is achieved. When a, com when a complaint is made about a councillor, for instance, and I know you no uh, complaint will be accepted on the telephone or just uh, met you some day in the town and said, look, I have a complaint to make. That's not the way it will be done. That's going to be done on writing. Will the councillor or the person whom the complaint is made against, will they be informed immediately in writing of the nature of the complaint? Um, yes, Chairman, that is the intention. Go ahead. Marie, the Sorry, yes, yes, yes. The, the, um, if I, I've mentioned complaints that are not for investigation and not in jurisdiction, but the, the, the bill as drafted puts a requirement, I think it's a duty on the Commissioner, to provide the person who's the subject of the investigation with an opportunity to comment on any allegation. Yes, so the, the, the nature of the complaint will be put in writing to them and said, look, yes, and, I think that is and the, the person who complained, their names will be given. Yes, right, okay. I think that's no. important. <coughs> I think it's important that those who accuse, yeah. that, the that you should know your accuser. Yes, that's fair. I think that's an important part of, of that's, fairness. Yeah, that's fine. And uh, Sorry, can I just, on the back of that, will the person who is making the complaint be made aware that that will happen. Absolutely. No, no, I think so, so from one the of earliest the, point absolutely the, through you to, to Mr. McRae, Chairman, I mean we do take transparency and openness seriously and it will be on our website and whoever is making a complaint will know from the website or the guidance of how to make a complaint that immediately we receive your complaint, provided it's properly made, we will be telling the the person complained of. Uh, uh, because I think they are entitled to know. Chair, if I could just develop this a wee bit more then. For instance, someone who has, is uh, on the receiving end of a complaint, and this breaks into the public arena, and it's kicked around, and as a subsequent to all of it, the particular councillor loses his seat, will, when it's been adjudicated upon, will that be taken into another account that all this malicious conduct actually cost that individual their seat. Yeah, it's too late. Also, and, so. Yeah. So what protection is in there for the public representative to be immune from that or protected from that? And if he can't be protected, 
What compensation is then due to him? Will he be one day awarded his seat because he was maliciously treated in, 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 the, in the press and the media? Uh, Mr. Chairman, to... some clarification, if I could, from Lord Morrow. Does he mean that the, uh, the adjudication vindicates the councillor? Yes. So the councillor has acted absolutely properly yes. and without fault. Yes. Um, now, the problem one would have or one could see in that circumstance is one would assume, therefore, that it was at the election through the ballot box that the individual lost his seat. Yes. The problem would be to demonstrate that it was because of this uh, event or, or this allegation that they lost their seat. Uh, now, I accept entirely that uh, clearly people who have the insights that you would have would say, look, he was an absolutely front runner for that particular uh, seat and uh, he could only have lost it because of this. But it would be very hard to make that judgment definitively because the argument could be the electorate decided and, and that's the ultimate decision. I, I, I wonder, just exploring this issue, is, is it something that, um, that could be the subject of defamation proceedings if the, end, if the malicious complaint had defamed um, the individual, the councillor, and that it was proven um, that those, those comments, those allegations were untrue? I think it would still be open to a councillor, as, as any person in a public position, to take um, defamation proceedings and that would may result in compensation I don't think it would it won't get you to the place of you have your seat back yeah. but in terms of compensation that you mentioned how do you prove though, that it was malicious that the complaint was actually malicious and not just mistaken or whatever um, well I think as I said to again through you chairman to um, uh, to, to, to an individual earlier in this in these exchanges, I mean, that is a judgment that the Commissioner for Standards should, should make. I mean, I said that if someone made a malicious complaint and it was judged to be so, then the um, Commissioner could judge that that was another, a, a breach of the standards uh, rules and would investigate whether it was malicious or not. So, I mean, I think the malicious nature of complaints would be something that the Commissioner and his or her staff should be very vigilant about always. Would it not be easier, though, uh, to just ensure that if you make that everything is confidential until there's a result? That, well, that well, everything is. But, but, uh, but you talked about sorry, you talked about the website. Well, I talk about the website purely and simply to give advice to people about how they should. I mean, I make. Do you not point. say that that who, that, the, that that who would be the complainant and the, the no, person no, being complained? No, no, I'm not talking about website. The website is purely to give advice to people on how they would, uh, what's required of them in making. Uh, complaint so that they know up front this is the detail this is the criteria yeah, must be met but I think following on from that point what what will be clear there will be leaflets and guidance available to making a complaint to the public it will be clear to them right from the beginning that every investigation will be conducted in private and that there is a duty of confidentiality on them yeah. as well as the councillor yeah. and other witnesses involved in the process. Yeah. So this is something that we've been discussing, my, my colleague here, Gillian, um, and, and I have been discussing about just the, the importance of putting as much information at the front of the process when the individual who makes the complaint knows this is a, is a confidential process and you must abide by that confidentiality. But I, I give the assurance also, Chairman, uh, in, in, in supporting Marie's point, that we live in a, I mean, I would say, a transformed world compared to where it was 10 years ago with internets and all this tweeting and all this stuff that goes on. And it's impossible to track these things. Uh, <clears throat> and, and a media that is voracious for these sorts of issues because it's, it's what sells papers or, or gets news. Uh, and therefore, very clearly, I think there is an issue that if the matter goes into the public arena through any of those channels, then there is a commitment on the part of the commissioner that the vindication for that individual will therefore be in the public arena. So, you know, and then a judgment made as to who actually broke the principle of confidentiality. Uh, now, it's very difficult, as, as I've just suggested, to, to find out who it is, but I mean, I said again about to Mr. Boylan earlier through you, Chairman, that my view was 
that the spirit of this is about the people on the pitch. Um, and again, the onus is on the people on the pitch. It would be impossible and unreasonable just to put the whole onus for this on a commissioner for, for standards or complaints to say, it's your business to manage and control the whole thing. So I think councillors equally might well wish to use the peer pressure of we need to have a standard here that we commit to and that we will deliver on. Chair, the problem with the players on the pitch is this. They sometimes want a referee also. <laughs> and uh, then we discover that not only do they want a referee, but all the good referees are sitting in the stand, <laughs> and the one that's actually doing his best out there, well, he knows nothing about a game. Now, I seldom go to football matches, but occasionally I would, and I discover that that the guy that's running about with the black outfit on him, he knows nothing about the game. <laughs> and all the people around me, they have all the answers to everything that happens. So all the good referees are not there, unfortunately. And we might be, that might become a syndrome with which you, you, you'll have to operate. But can I, can I ask you this in, in, in relation to uh, malicious complaints that don't take us anywhere? What is the penalty? for the person who makes that malicious complaint? Well, I think there is a, again, clearly, if, if, the, um, if the individual is covered by the standards uh, uh, legislation, i.e. if they're an elected member themselves, then I think there is an issue about how you, how you, how, how you can enforce uh, some, some sanction on them. I mean, if they're a member of the public, then I think there is a different problem immediately. I think Marie has made the point that there are Contempt. defamation and, o and other recourses open to people. Um, um, and I think that's something clearly which we have to, uh, to consider. But I, I suppose at the end of the day, the, the, the infamous sort of public accusation, private apology is, is always there. And uh, it's, it's a real problem for us in this area. And it affects in a, all aspects of public life. What about time factor on all of this? Yep. Uh, from the date the complaint is lodged to the date that the findings are made known can be a long period of time. Yep. I suspect it could go into years. Uh, now maybe, hopefully it will not. I think, but I think if you accept the, the, the model that we are proposing, then it shouldn't. Okay. It should be done. Uh, now, one can't guarantee the time frame, but I would say certainly there should be an absolute principle that because someone's reputation uh, or someone's standing or character is being questioned, there is an absolute urgency about vindication and closure. So I would see that as a principle. How do you deal with on, on cooperative uh, departments who are saying, by the way, there's a complaint here, well, that's not top of our agenda, just let that sit there a couple of months. Uh, or whatever time we have the staff to respond to that, we deal with it. I think this, again, we have been discussing this. I think our intention is that when we write out to a department or body and ask for information, we will give them a time scale. And if they don't comply within the time scale, we will send a warning letter, which refers back to the protections I mentioned earlier, which is under Article 14 of the Commissioner for Complaints order. Um, we may consider um, bringing uh, proceedings for obstruction because the Article 14 provision allows the Commissioner to certify for obstruction or contempt. And I would say the failure to provide information and the continued failure to provide information um, it is, is obstruction and, pot and potentially... will delay the process a bit further. It may, it may delay the process, but on our experience, uh, I have to say, to date, involve, involving maladministration complaints is that that letter of warning works. We have never had to certify to the High Court for an obstruction from a reluctant provider of information. I have to, and I do think that's an important assurance to give the committee, Chairman, the level of compliance um, from public bodies and from departments in terms of our core work is, is 100%. Now, not, a, not always as timely as it should be, let me say, but let me assure this committee, I go back to it. If it's an issue about someone's reputation or character, then as far as I'm concerned, deadlines are deadlines and they're not negotiable. And Chair, finally, if I could say judicial reviews, and I know you have uh, flagged this up uh, yourself, but they are a costly yeah. exercise, so they are. They are also sometimes off-putting yeah. uh, to the individual 
perhaps who feels very grieved uh, and uh, whether they can draw off the public purse. And I know it's easy cutting wangs of another man's leather. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything, so therefore you can be maybe careless, just for the sake of a better word, uh, and you don't have to be as particular if you're not paying for it. And I, and I think you, Mr Crawley, did cite the fact that you were very conscious that there had to be probity around this and their accountability uh, because it was, after all, the public purse that we were dealing with here. And I was glad to hear you say that. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Cal, would you want to come back in quickly? Tom would have been on the pitch. I wouldn't like to be the one getting the red card. But the, the issue first, obviously, was the criteria of admiss admissibility, but also a key element now that you mentioned the website clearly defining that grounds on what actually the complaint would be about. Because I've noticed through standards and privileges we're starting to learn a bit more about it, how that process it is works. It our intention to do a significant amount of work on our website and publishing um, details of how to make a complaint, but how if a counsellor, if you were the subject of a complaint, how we will deal with you. <coughs> And, um, and, and th th that is part of the cost for which we have, have bid for in terms of um, the, the overall cost. I also think, Chairman, one of the things that we are looking at, and clearly <clears throat> timescales are important here, I would certainly think it's important once all of this is finalised, and hopefully it will be in a time frame, must be in a time frame ahead of the election and so on, uh, that I will certainly commit to going out into the, the local geographies particularly to the prospective councillors and to those who are elected afterwards to really emphasise the issues and the values that we've aired today. So it will not be that anyone can put their hand up and say, I didn't know, no one told me, I misunderstood. The other thing that I would hope, and I think it's important again in terms of leadership from the Assembly itself, that a very clear expectation would be articulated that there would be induction programmes for councillors before each council or as each council is convened there that, that, that an hour or an hour and a half of attendance at a meeting on standards would be, uh, would be important and vital and people would commit to attend so that again we can continue to hammer home this concept of transparency, openness, confidentiality, clear and build up a sort of a culture of ethics is an integral part of what we do and being ethically driven and informed is absolutely central to good politics. That culture is so, so important that you have that as a corporate culture that you, know, you all have to abide by the code of conduct. And so you want quickly to come in? Uh, sorry, I have... Uh, I'll be just on this point. So. Okay. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. On the point you make around the, the training and the on standards, do you not feel that it should be compulsory that that any new councillor to the new you know super councils, if that's what people still want to call them, you know the, the, the training should be compulsory because you know I've witnessed on many occasions where you know council staff try to organise um, you know certain training things for for councillors to benefit the council. And the councillors themselves for future, you know, possible um, things that come through. So, you know, so I would be more in in, in the line of it should be compulsory. So. Again, far be it for me. I, I I think that I will look forward to the the new bit Ulster Council and its compulsory attendance at the induction program. <laughs> um, but, but because <laughs> I, I, what I am saying to indeed. <laughs> well, indeed, what I am saying, and I give you an absolute commitment, I will happily attend such events. I will be there. Uh, and I and I think it's for the I think individual councils should demonstrate their commitment by saying it is compulsory. It is not uh, voluntary. Uh, and I would also argue, as as another important little piece of the jigsaw, that we might develop. And I would suggest either in individual councils or by the office of the standards commissioner, um, um, a, a form which would say. I have been inducted in and I understand and I accept the requirements of the standards arrangements that exist in this council, signed a councillor and a date, uh, so that, that there be no doubt as to where we all are in terms of how we're going to commit. So I'm very happy to facilitate those order mechanics. It's not in my gift to make this compulsory. It is in the gift of the legislature to make it compulsory or alternatively the individual councils. A written contract between Absolutely. the council Absolutely. and the councillors. Yeah.
Yeah. Could be done. I'm sure they sign a lot of documents <laughs> when they become councillors. Yeah. Um, Con very briefly, yeah. apologies for coming back on it again, but what do you, because I just thought of it, what do, you, what do you think of the idea of a, a moratorium on complaints uh, for a period of time before an election? You know, people can complain after the election or before that particular time, um, but it might get rid of that idea where you get a whole flood uh, in and around the election, and some of those complaints might not be made after the election. The only problem you have, if I may say so, in, in, in Northern Ireland, which is a bit of a hothouse for elections. Elections tend to start immediately after the last one is finished. Uh, so you, you would have a real difficulty in deciding yeah, when does it begin. Uh, secondly, I think the nature of some of the complaints you might argue are so powerfully in the public interest that you, this would be wrong. to st So you'd be making a judgment qualitatively. I think it would be a, a very helpful thing. The only moratorium you'll ever get is the discipline of people themselves to say, and of course the very reason that someone does make a complaint in that atmosphere of a pre-election is because they want to impact on either another candidate or their own candidature. Mm. Uh, it might it be helpful, Chair, if I explain that one of the things that, again, we're developing while developing the procedures, um, the, the Commissioner has a time limit in terms of his complaint in which he will accept complaints of maladministration. It must be in respect of a decision or action that has happened within the last 12 months. Mm. And, you know, that these should not be old complaints, old gripes that have been uh, around for a long time. Um, and I think that 12 month period, I think that's also something that we will adopt <coughs> when we look more ca carefully at the admissibility criteria, so that it has to be something that has happened within the last 12 months. 12 months is actually quite to, a long time. Tis, when you I look at the Equality we, again, Commission, think, uh, making complaints has to be kind of within sometimes three chairman. months. But I think yeah. it's still within the discretion no, no. of the. Yeah. Of, that is all couched within the discretion yeah. of the Commissioner. I think what you would want, I mean, I think one of the things we're we're saying, Chairman, is that we do see a time limit. Um, I think we would have to then make a judgment about what is an appropriate time limit. Clearly the issue is about when someone becomes aware of something. Uh, now you, there is a fundamental issue if someone is aware of something and 12 months later decides, well I think I'll deal with that now. Well clearly it doesn't say much about the urgency or the significance of the issue for them. And it is being in some ways manipulative by then introducing it. So I think there is a very clear judgment of what the time scale should be and we would certainly look at that. Alban, you've been very patient. Well, uh, <laughs> I think most of the questions have been exhausted, but uh, I, I would remind uh, uh, Mr. Frawley uh, and his colleagues that at Nilga, uh, at the meeting of the 7th of January, unfortunately I wasn't able to attend it, but uh, they, they again raised the issue of an appeals mechanism. So whilst you might be able to persuade this committee or other colleagues, you may have a job trying to persuade them in relation to the argument that you put forward uh, and maybe to, uh, uh, re uh, to, to uh, recapitulate that particular argument. Uh, uh, what you're really saying is that the Office of Ombudsman uh, has a certain authority and, and uh, uh, legal authority and uh, that it would be inappropriate in circumstances to have a separate appeals mechanism other than judicial review. Um, I, I'm not sure whether councillors would be fully convinced by that argument. Uh, I find it quite persuasive, but uh, councillors as, as a, a body of people might not uh, be, be um, persuaded as to that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Chairman, I, I think, uh, well, one, can I thank uh, Mr. McGuinness for, for indicating he does accept the, the, the argument. I, I mean, again, you know, the reality of the world is I think that part of the experience of people is this, this word appeal. Um, and it, it's the, formal, the formulation of an arrangement by which there is this forum uh, where uh, I come to articulate my view and, and the, the people who have a different view articulate theirs and there's a panel making a judgment about it and so on. Um, you know, that's not different from representation to the, to the Ombudsman, where both parties to the case come in to argue their case or make their representation. And we are clearly indicating, as Marie did, that at the adjudication point, 
people who wish to have legal representation to make that case forcefully, powerfully, and professionally, you might argue, uh, will have that, will be facilitated in doing that. And so there is no real difference between these two things other than the word appeal. Um, and if you like, the panel does adjudicate. Uh, the, the, the appeal panel adjudicates on the sides of the argument they've heard. So the word we're using is adjudicate. So it is not a formal appeal, but to us it is the alternative model, and it has served us well, and we are very, very anxious, as Marie said in her uh, comments, to protect the integrity of our process, and that is very vital to us because that's the core that we must protect. I think... Uh, who makes up the appeal? Body, or not, not the appeals body, but the, the panel that you're talking about. There's no panel, it's just the commissioner. Just the individual. Solely. The individual. Yeah. The individual. I, I, I think, Mr. McGuinness, there is already a model that exists in, in, in local government for investigation and adjudication by a single decision maker, and that is in relation to the um, functions of the local government auditor when, when she investigates whether there has been willful misconduct on the part of the councillor, and she also adjudicates on the question of whether surcharge will be imposed. And that decision and those functions are not subject to appeal, they are subject to judicial review. So that model already exists. Uh, just one further point, again, I'll give you this point on the 7th of January, in relation to councillors who are on other outside bodies. Uh, and I think the basic argument is that there's an inherent unfairness that a councillor should be subject to uh, a, a um, code of conduct, whereas other individuals who are doing a similar task, performing a similar function or not. And it does raise an issue there. Chairman, through you, I completely agree with that. I, I genuinely believe, and, and I, as some people may know, I worked in the health service for 30 years. I do believe that public, people appointed to public bodies should have a code of conduct that they are accountable for. And I don't see why it should be different to the code that councillors, and so then you would have equivalence and everyone would be in the same circumstance to account for your decisions in your performance and if you operate outside the rules of, of the standards then you are you are made amenable um, and I think that is not and again I, you know it's not for me but that is in the gift of this legislature and I think Northern Ireland could break very new ground and important ground in saying we have expectations of people who, who operate in the public sphere because we've demonstrably now shown what we expect of councillors, we equally want those who are on public bodies to be just as accountable and just as uh, susceptible to investigation and complaint. I have no problem with that, whatever. The final thing I would make about NILGA, which again I respect and, the, and they do great work on behalf of the whole community of councillors, is that, that of course they have a perspective and I totally respect it. I've offered you mine this morning, Chairman. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Tom? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, as always, very, very interesting. Two comments. First, Justin, uh, Marie, you did mention the local government auditor. I'm not sure it's always the best. Uh, one to hold up as, as a good process. And <laughs> I don't know whether you were doing that or not, but no, I'm, I'm I, just I, making I that comment. I am aware of, the, of, of a, a judicial review in which yeah. they were, uh, their decision was overturned because yeah, there was insufficient so I. evidence. I know, and I'm aware yes. of that. <laughs> do you know whether, Chair I don't know whether it's really declaring an interest here. <laughs> Chair, the, the second issue, um, you, your very last point, or one of your last points, Mr. Frawley, about the competence of this legislation yes. um, having, uh, I suppose, a, a basis for other people who sit on, on outside bodies or organisations. I don't know whether it is within the competence of this legislation, but no. certainly it is within the competence of this Assembly Correct. to do something about it. So uh, I think you, you, your point is well made. Um, my first question is quite a simple one. Uh, I know you would have to implement the legislation here, but do you agree with the principles within the, this legislation? Yes, I do. I do, do. Chairman. I'm, I'm okay. content with them, yeah. All right. Uh, 
My other question is around the complaint in writing. That the complaint must be made in writing. And, and when I was on another committee, we had uh, long discussions about how a complaint could be made to the Ombudsman. And uh, there was almost agreement, or, or at least there was long debates and discussions about it, whether it could be made in text form or, or by phone calls. And are you content that it, it can only be made in writing? Uh, because I foresee, I suppose looking at it from the other side, I, I foresee maybe an argument from uh, people who, who work in departments and the civil service saying, well, look, people can complain about us and decisions that we have made just by sending a simple text or a, a phone call. Uh, whereby, in this case, if you're complaining about a council, it must be made in writing? Well, no, I, I, I think we may need to clarify that, Chairman. It isn't just that you make a, a complaint by text. I think it has to be a little bit more than a text. I, uh, here's a complaint, two words. Uh, what, what we would suggest is what we're looking to is for people who will actually, uh, of course, say they want to make a complaint and, and this is what it is, uh, you know, there are people, and you know, this committee was aware of this more than I am, there are people who would have difficulty writing a complaint, not for any reason other than maybe misfortune and, 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 and maybe challenges that they've not been able to overcome in terms of literacy and other things. Um, in that circumstance, one would assist, you know, what they want to write, well, we will help you to put it on a page. But you have to come here and you have to say who you are and you have to say where you live and you have to tell us and know that this complaint will be shared with the person you're complaining about. So I wouldn't want it to be, unless you can write me a letter and you can have a stamp on an envelope and send it to me, it will not be a properly made complaint. We would assist to make it, to get it formalized if, if, the, if the circumstances warranted that. But we would need to make that judgment. So we wouldn't yeah. obstruct people from making complaints. Chairman, the, the, the issue I'm just making is that, you know, in, in the Ombudsman, it is much easier to make a complaint than just in a written yeah. format yeah. Uh, than it would be in this case. Yes. That's the only point yes. I'm making that yeah. there is a differential there. There is. There is. Is there possibly one difference? I appreciate trying to come in on this. One state degree difference in while well, it may be an individual civil servant who has taken a particular decision, largely speaking to the Ombudsman, but it is largely if like a complaint against a government body. Against an organisation. So the repercussion can be more or less for the body, whereas here, if you're talking about a complaint, it's against, it'll ultimately be against an individual council. Peter, you would know, always come up with a civil service answer. You always do. <laughs> I, 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 Tom, I would be a civil servant, but I, I couldn't take the pay rise. No. <laughs> oh, I don't want to get caught in the crossfire. Sure. The, the referee wants to get off the pitch. Oh, I think you could Let's justify it. Let's move Yes. <laughs> Please, Tom. Sure, that's fine. Okay, Tom. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ian, next to you. No, mine's is uh, a question of, uh, you know, you're saying that this here, the code should be in place now by uh, May. Yes. And uh, that will apply to those elected into the, the new councils. What about those that aren't standing for the new councils and are still going to be councillors for that year? Uh, will you be fit to uh, adjudicate? On, on people in that position? No, um, has this I, been uh, taken into account? That hasn't account? been advised to me, but my understanding is it relates to the new councillors. It does not relate to the councils currently that exist. Well, fair enough. It will be from April, uh, May 2014, mm -hmm. yes. Yes. the Shadow Council, yes. starting from the Shadow Council. But it will operate under the period they are in shadow. Yeah. Again, just to clarify then, uh, does that also then relate to the capacity in which if there's a complaint against, so that presumably, yes. uh, because there's presumably likely to be during that year quite a lot of people here to be of overlap, so it's presumably in the performance of duties as it relates to the new council. Absolutely, so Absolutely Chairman, yeah. through you. Thank you. Yeah. And the induction has to be done fairly quickly yes. as well, yes. as you yes. say, yes. almost immediately. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. <laughs> You've already expressed their views in your paper? Yes. yes. Sorry, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. It's only a very informative exchange of, of, of information and very robust discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Members. Thank you. Okay, members, we certainly seem to have clarified quite a lot of points.
Is there any other issues from the discussions we have had just now that we want to go back to the department and ask for clarification? Sure. They're coming now. Come. Yes. I think I think yeah. One thing has come out of that discussion. There are still quite a number of grey areas, and uh, while I feel that uh, the folk there gave a very detailed and honest uh, response to anything that they were asked, I still think that there are a number of issues uh, that. Can you speak up a little bit? There are still a number of issues that I do feel. Uh, Maybe only time <laughs> will work them all out, but I think that there are some things or issues that there's not clar total clarity around uh, in the functioning of the new councils and the complaints procedures and etc. etc. Uh, and I'm not and I do agree here with what Ian McRae said in relation to the compulsory bit for training for new councillors. I believe it should be compulsory for their protection, mm -hmm. so that they are made fully aware. Uh, you know of the implications and what could come onto their door one day, and they're better to go into that position educated than that than in ignorance. Yeah. Yeah. And not just that induction. There's something that they can take home. They yeah. can refer to it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I suppose they can only work within the constraint of the bill of the of legislation. Uh, you know the, the the commission. Yeah. Okay. Um, I uh, yes. thought that Ian, uh, Ian Millen's question, mm -hmm. I wasn't 100% convinced that uh, Tom understood the point being made. I could be wrong, but uh, you know, does it apply to councillors who remain in a district council? No, but I, I think he did. Well, put this way, because my follow-up, I suppose, yes. was to try and tease that out a bit, yes. because what he's saying is, uh, I think, is it doesn't apply to anybody who is on the existing or the existing council in that capacity on it. Yes. But if it if for the sake of argument, if there was a concern over a decision say sort of to refer uh, say a planning application to you know, whatever, say there was some allegation of corruption in that and it was being done by the existing council, then it wouldn't apply if you had a particular decision that's taken in shadow format by the same councillor and there was a question mark over that because of some but it would apply on that on that. Before he said that I thought he said I didn't receive any advice on that. All right, okay. So I just wonder, you know, was he reacting? Uh, was he making it up as he went along on that point because he didn't receive advice? I don't think none of us would ever do that. You know, I just wonder, could we clarify that in writing? Seek clarification in writing, either from the department or whoever, as to the standing of. Okay. They're coming in now, directly. Okay. okay. These people are coming. I thought what he was but saying. You can write them, or we don't. Nice. That's right. I mean, I suppose until you have the new code, the code of conduct, you know, you cannot ju make an assessment. So the code of conduct only apply to new councillors when the new councils are established. So you know, if you've done something wrong now, outside, um, you know, breaching the code of conduct in future, you cannot be held to account. Yeah, I think that that was what he meant. Yeah. No, you said it was Yeah, we'll clarify. So, uh, members, quite timely, we now have our next uh, uh, briefing, which is from uh, from the department, and we're specifically talking about code of conduct uh, for councillors. Uh, members, you have uh, the consultation paper at page 81. Um, and members, this is a pre-consultation with stakeholders and will be followed by a full public consultation. And if I can uh, uh, welcome the usual team, uh, Linda, Julie and uh, Fiona and uh, is that Mali? Mali, yes, yes, yeah. Okay, um, Sonny, we're all very interested to hear about the code of conduct and that you're working on. So over to you, Linda. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come to you today. Um, 
Before really the Minister goes out to full public consultation, we felt it would be very useful to send this out to some key stakeholders and to get initial views so that the Minister can then take that on board before the full consultation process kicks off in early February. Um, I'm joined by some of my legislation team and also Fiona from um, Planning Division because there is an element of this code that clearly relates specifically to planning, so we felt it would be useful to have her there. Um, and you know that we have have worked very closely with both our colleagues in planning and with the Commissioner for Complaints um, in the drafting of the code. Um, but before we got to that stage, um, and as you've heard me say before, you know, this is another area that's been a long time in the process, and um, the whole principle of the need for a code of conduct was very um, carefully debated during the stages um, when we had p the Policy Development Panel A. Um, and you know, at that stage, there was research done into um, the principles and the codes in other jurisdictions, um, and that model, uh, those models were amended to make sure that they were relevant for Northern, Northern Ireland. Um, more recently, we have um, worked with the Legislation Working Group, which includes representatives from local government, including NILGA, um, and it's been very useful to get their um, views on how this could be operationalised. Um, so we've come to you today with a document that has already had a lot of input from some of the people that are going to be um, using this. Um, in terms of, of its principles, I'm not going to go through the whole document in detail, but clearly um, it's based on the seven Nolan principles um, of, of public service, public life, and also the five further assembly principles um, to align it as closely as possible um, with the regime in, in the assembly. Um, it's also very closely linked to the wider governance issues, and you've already heard this morning um, from the Commissioner of Complaints about how the complaints procedure works. And really, this code sets the rule book against which the Commissioner will determine if there's been a breach. So it is an important document. It also links to a number of other key documents that will be produced or are in the process of being produced. One is clearly the guidance from the Commissioner for Complaints as to the interpretation of the um, Code of Conduct and how that will interlink with the complaints and complaints procedure. Um, there is also further planning procedural guidance which will have relevance to, to um, the ethical issues around planning that are enshrined in the Code. Um, the Local Government Reform Joint Forum, which is a body, um, a consultative body comprising both management side and local government and central government and trade unions, is currently working on a staff code of conduct. And there's a very, very important correlation between the two codes. Um, and jointly, um, we will be bringing together a group of both elected members and people from the joint forum to look at a protocol that will act as a bridge between those two codes because one important element is behaviour of councillors towards staff and staff towards councillors. So we need to get that link up right. Um, the code will have a statutory basis um, and the draft code will need to be laid in the assembly um, and endorsed by the assembly through draft affirmative actions so it will be fully debated. Um, the other issue I think that's been discussed this morning is um, who the code will actually apply to. Um, I think the initial proposal was that it would be just the new councillors, but actually looking through the operational issues that that might create, where you have, for a period of that transition period between um, May 2014 and April 2015, you could have two sets of councillors one to which the code applies and one that doesn't. And did you could have one councillor sitting on both the old and new councils where they would have to decide what hat on as to whether the, the code applied or not. So just last week, um, we got agreement from the minister um, that uh, this code would apply to existing councillors as well as new councillors once it comes into operation. And I think operationally, that is the only way forward. And this operationally from... May 2014 it was, was the new council. Um, it would, it would apply to all councillors, okay. Okay. but it will not apply to people beyond councillors because we don't have a jurisdiction in this bill, certainly, to apply legislation to outside local government. 
Um, the final point, and again, I think that was, that was discussed with the Commissioner for Complaints, is the need for training and capacity building, um, both for councillors and, and I think also for local government officers in the procedures and the meaning of the code and, and how complaints will be delivered. Um, we would clearly identified the need for this, and it is already um, part of the overarching capacity building framework that we have developed, again, in partnership with local government. Um, and I am very pleased that the Commissioner for Complaints um, is offering to take a very proactive role in that um, both, both the Commissioner himself and, and his colleagues in the office. Um, and I, I would very, welcome, very much welcome their support in um, being very... <coughs> yes. And yes, get and, and the councillors to sign on the dot to yeah. say they will abide, you buy it. Yeah, yes. and it's in everybody's interest that we mm. all know the ground rules from the outset. Yeah. Um, so at that point, um, I'm not going to say any more, but we would be very happy to take any specific questions that you have on the code. Okay, okay. Uh, what about the time scale of of the consultation, Linda? This is just for stakeholders, isn't it? Um, th this is just a very short, sharp okay. two to three week um, process, but we plan to go out to full public consultation in early February. Um, we are looking at possibly an eight week consultation, um, but considering that we have already done quite a lot of work with key, key stakeholders, uh, you know, I'm hoping that won't be an issue, um, because then it would need to, to go further and be developed into something that can be introduced in time for the end of May. Okay. Because um, sometimes the weasel words, you need further explanation as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I'm just looking at respect, uh, you know, good relations. You really need to pin it down. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, any other questions? I, right, I have Carl first, and then Tom next. Thanks very yeah. much, Chair, and once again, thank you very much for your presentation. You're very welcome. Um, just moving on to obviously. We need to look at this issue about those people who are in outside bodies and doing the same job as councillors, even though they may come from the community and voluntary sector, um, how we facilitate them, because there, is, there has been issues raised yes. in addition to that. I mean, I could see through the point that those people who are actually in the public sector, because there should be a code of conduct right across the public sector in relation to that, um, I could see through them going through a process. I know you only indicated local authority, but there should be in terms of public sector itself, there should be a code of conduct. But is, is there any scope or is any talk from the Minister's office in relation to looking at the community voluntary sector in relation to this code? Um, we understand the concerns that there are about, you know, if, if councillors are acting on other bodies, mm -hmm. that the code will apply to them, but it may not apply to others. But I really think it would be outside the scope of this bill for us to be able to deal with that, because we can only deal with councils and councillors. Um, I think it would be a matter for either those other bodies to come up with a code or else, as the Commissioner mentioned, possibly a, a much wider issue of you know, um, people who are you know, appointed to public appointments, a code applying to them. It's, it, it, but it's very easy for that body actually to bring a complaint as an, somebody as an individual. See, if they make a decision as mm -hmm. a corporate body. Yes. It would be very easy for somebody in, in that sitting on that committee or whatever the case may be to bring a complaint if if the council was the sponsoring body, you know what I mean, in yes. terms of funding it. And it's it's very difficult to square that circle. You, and yes. you can see the genuine concerns yes. there would be in relation to that. Because the general public seeing all of this coming in because there's an expectation of what's going on the town. And that's what we need to be very, very careful of. And that's why I tried to nail down the issue of um, admissibility criteria yes. and what it can, you know what I mean? Because that would protect yes. in some ways yeah. um, complaints against against special council. There clearly also has to be a demarcation line between what is a the decision of a body or a corporate decision and the behaviours of an individual. And this is really less about decision making and more about a set of behaviours and um, you know an approach and, and it's the, the, the action of the individual as opposed to the collective that this is re applying to. You know, we're just trying to get examples because the yeah. actual decision could lead to yeah. the complaint yes. which could be interpreted. Mm -hmm. that's all. Just I mean we are aware that, that some other um, bodies do have their own um, code of conduct and clearly if a councillor is sitting on that body that, that will also apply to the, the councillor. Um, 
But would they be subject to two sets of codes of conduct? Well, I think the Code of Conduct, as drafted, said it will be if they are on um, another body and that body has a Code of Conduct, it will be that code that really you know, would have precedence. But, of course, the general behaviours, you know, if they're acting as a councillor or representing a council on that body, they would have to take account of the code, but it would be that other body's code, if it has a code, that would um, you know, take precedence. No, I understand. I mean, we're Obviously, you, can, you understand why we keep asking the question. Yeah. It's about the complaint, the complaint that may be made in relation to, to councils. It's not about, all right, we've got the code of conduct, and yes. mm -hmm. you, you hope that the, they will con conduct themselves in a proper manner. But it's just outside of that. We're just trying to envisage exactly what would go wrong there, and who would be accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other issues, I mean, we are aware of, although uh, I know it's at a very early stage, is um, the OFM DFM committee are actually um, taking forward a bill, uh, a Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman bill, and this might be something that you know, would be appropriate for, for that bill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is outside the scope of this bill. Yeah, yeah. The difficulty <coughs> with the Code of Conduct for other members setting safe on a on the planning community planning panel or whatever, then if they are coming from outside, um, even if there's a code of conduct, should a commissioner of complaint can't um, really investigate those people who are not councillors? It will extend, though, <clears throat> there is provision within this regime that people who are appointed to a committee, but they're not an elected representative, will also be covered by the code. So we're trying to contain it within yeah. the, the local government community so that anybody who, who has a, a part to play on a committee but isn't elected will also have to abide by the code and they will have to sign up to that's it That's just well. committee, that's, yes, not, that's not that's like the general panels. Mm. Or, yeah. However, a community partnership would be yeah. a body that actually would be determined, that how, how it operates would be determined by the council. So actually the council would be in a position to set a code of conduct oh, okay. for everybody sitting on that partnership or on that on that committee, you know, on that body. Okay. Okay. Yep. But people still can take a complaint to the commissioner for complaint against those mm -hmm. members who are not councillors. Certainly not under <coughs> this code no, and no. The, the wider complaints regime no. that we're putting into place in this bill. Okay. Okay. Uh, Tom? Thank you, Chair. Thanks for, for that. Uh, two queries. One is around um, when the code must be observed. And I notice part 4 or D, it says at all times and in any capacity. And clearly, that's very wide ranging. And I'm just wondering how that would work if, if a councillor were sitting on his church organisation or, um, or in a community group and it was implicated that he was there. He he believed he or she believed as a councillor they were there in their private capacity, but others said, "Well, look, like, you know, you are a councillor, you can't get away from that fact." So, um, how would that operate in, in those circumstances? Well, if, it, well, if a councillor was say um, appointed to as, as a school governor, it wouldn't apply in that case. But if he was on maybe on more of a, a public uh, appointment, like a, on an education board or something like that, it would. So there is a, a, a there is a distinction there. I just think that needs a bit more clarity then, because it does yes. say at all times and in any capacity. Now, that is extremely wide ranging. Um, it also, I think it also um, goes into the area of, of when people perce the perception of somebody, if they perceive that somebody is acting as a councillor and it may not be in the council environment. And it's, it's that um, that we're trying to cover in that sense. It certainly doesn't say it in that part of you know, your local community might ask you to sit on something, um, but there are lots of bodies and boards that you would be appointed to as a councillor from the council. So is that what, is that what the yeah. distinction is? So I think that's fair enough, Colin. I, sorry, Chair, I accept that point of yours. Oh, my only query is the way this is written, uh, in that it says at all times and in any capacity. You know, that, that is a 
extremely wide ranging. I, I know in other sections it does explain further details, but in, in this section, uh, section two, it is clearly very wide ranging. And we can look at that issue before we actually go out to full consultation, because that's actually the benefit of having this pre-consultation. That hopefully we can deal with, you know, any major issues before yeah. we go Clarify. out to the public. Clarify the limitation, the boundary. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scary to say that at all times. You know, you're walking the dog. <laughs> it could be, could be one. My second point, Chair, is around the planning issue. And, uh, I suppose councillors believe that they will have very limited powers in, in the new planning mechanisms anyway, and they will see this as a further restriction to, to planning and, and noticing. Uh, page 22, decisions contrary to plan to officer recommendation. You must never seek to pressure planning officers to provide a particular recommendation on any planning decision. If you propose, second or support a decision contrary to an officer's recommendation, you will need to clearly identify and understanding the planning reasons for doing so. Well, you know, most people can make a case quite often it's not upheld in fairness, but you, most councillors can make a case as to why they would go against the planning officer's decision. That's, that's what happens at the, at the moment. Uh, but I, I do feel that uh, there will be a perception that that is you know, limiting the scope of that. I'm just wondering of the, the views on that. Yeah, uh, recognise the, the comment, but I think the key word here, um, Mr. Elliott, is pressure the planning officer. Uh, uh, um, it's um, within the remit of a councillor to, um, to represent uh, and to lobby uh, in relation to um, his uh, or her constituents. Um, but it's pressure the planning officer in terms of particular recommendation. Um, I, think, I think that's where the, the, the important point is. And um, in, in doing that, um, the whole purpose of the planning element of the code is to provide clarity of the roles and responsibilities of councillors in, ter in terms of planning, and um, it is to uh, ensure uh, and, and provide protection to councillors uh, in, in relation to that. Um, that particular, as I said, that particular point in relation to, uh, to pressurising planning officers um, is, not, uh, is not to pressure them into a situation, but yes, to make representation where representation is appropriate. Just feel that there will be huge arguments over what, what's pressure and what's, yeah. um, what's reasonable yeah. representation. I, point in that. I, mean, I, think I understand sort of what, what's been said and understand the intention. I don't know if there may need to be a bit of, we bit of manoeuvring around with the wording on that, because you know, I suppose to some extent it's, it's creating sort of, you want to avoid a situation where there's undue pressure on, on things. I think that there may be a wee bit of an issue then of interpretation, because to take an example, and I appreciate there's also a distinction depending upon what way planning operates is going to operate in terms of whether you have, for instance, all the council on the planning, but you know, you have a council that isn't legitimately may, uh, if they're not on the planning committee lobby a particular bit, well, you know, at the moment when you're talking about pressure, I mean, is, for example, someone who, and it's clearly, I don't think, intended, you have someone that's not on the planning committee, who then contacts the officer to say, well, you see, you know, uh, that set of apartments is due to go or is being proposed to go in there. You know, I think there's a lot of concern within the, the local community that, that this will be, um, you know, an undue increase in terms of the number of, of you know, it'll have major effect in terms of parking, etc., etc. Now, you know, there can be a slightly grey area then between then the legitimate sort of indication of uh, here is, you know, here's sort of I'm making my views known on a particular thing. The what counts as pressure, and you know, I think that there may need to be something that things down a wee bit more, um, in in connection with that. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think I think you're right, and that's where we we are developing guidance. Um, this this um, insert into the planning code is very um, high level, and we are proposing um, to develop guidance which will will deal with the specific actions in in terms of, presume, of the planning. Presumably, just as well on this issue. I mean, I presume in terms of. Those maybe, uh, it may well be contained within the, the code, but in terms of the draft code and what you've said, particularly that this will be playing in the shadow period and to new councillors in connection with that, I presume there is then some caveated line within this because most of the, the bulk of the planning stuff is actually stuff when it's post uh, it being devolved. A lot of that wouldn't, 
I, all right, you know, you, you shouldn't be able to do pressure on a, an officer in here, but a lot of this stuff is stuff that, that shouldn't be related to pre sort of transfer of, of planning. So I presume if you're intending to bring in the code at that point, there is some sort of then differentiation between that part of the planning code will only become effective once planning is, is, is devolved in that, in that regard. That's something that we can look at. I mean, um, the provision to apply the code um, both to um, current councillors and new councillors will be through the transitional provisions um, regulations which make provision for the shadow arrangements and we're finalising those at the moment but we can look at that provision again. I mean, uh, you know, like it's, yes. Like it's probably all the, the planning stuff all contained within, well, I probably suppose there is, there is sort of dotted other references to planning. You know, I, I think you, you do need something which is quite explicit because, you know, in the broad sense, leaving aside the caveats that Tom and myself have, have highlighted a little bit on, on those issues, there may be a few things where they may need a bit of tweaking on the, the broader planning stuff, but there's a lot of stuff in there which wouldn't be appropriate at present, but would be appropriate on the planning side, once planning was, was devolved, I mean, it would be massively too restrictive if, it's, if this is pre the transfer of, of, of planning on those aspects. On I think a lot of the other wider stuff about code of conduct is, is fair enough in that, in that regard. And we can look at that and we can look at maybe reorganising the code so that everything, all references to planning, are in the planning yeah, section. The transition bit that you, know, that, yes. that you sort of say, you know, section 8 or whatever shall not, of the code shall not apply, apply until yes. you know, yes. the department makes an order or whatever. You know, I'm sure there's... <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Just on that point, I mean, the key element to it is the capacity building element. You mean they understand? I know you have the code and everything else, but you know, because, like I said, there's an expectation out there, and there's councillors are going to be making decisions, and clearly they need to understand because this is the back end of it in terms of putting pressure on. on yeah, we recognise that, and, and there will be a significant amount of capacity building um, carried out, particularly for councillors who are sitting on planning committees. Um, um, we will be developing that and uh, once we've, we finalise the guidance, um, um, we intend to carry out a significant amount of capacity building. There seems to be some inconsistency between councils because there was a recent case of um, a planning application uh, opinion uh, by the planner to the Belfast City Council for approval and then one uh, councillor asked for a deferral and then leading to the decision being reversed. I heard from other councillors and saying how come that, you know, that the Belfast City Council would do that, would allow only a single councillor to, uh, to, uh, to delay the process in, in order... I'm not sure necessarily that's what sometimes what is reported is necessarily what, what happened. If a deferral is asked for, it's brought up, the application for deferral is brought at a planning committee meeting. Yes. Yes. The planning committee has to then agree with the deferral. Yes. Right. And yes. then the, the officer can agree for the decision yeah. to be deferred or whatever. Right. So it, it's certainly from the formal process. Now, you know, people can raise a particular objection yes. to it and planning service may react before that and say, well, we're looking at that objection. Actually, maybe we will pull this off the schedule. But from a deferral, there isn't anywhere, whether it's Belfast or wherever, a capacity for one person to say, well, I object to this, mm -hmm. consequently it is deferred. It's and actually it the planning committee would have had to, to agree. So sometimes those things, because it's maybe one councillor has mm. raised the issue, mm. that is then reported as being one councillor got it deferred. That's not, okay. that's not accurate. Well, that's what sometimes, sometimes the press reports these yeah. things don't necessarily... Yeah. Well, some other councillors said, that's, that's when I'm, other councillors said, oh, how come... That's a practice then, in, in the Belfast City Council. One councillor could ask for 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 you know decision to be to be re looked at. So okay, I suppose Peter answered my point. <laughs> take up that point. We we intend to develop a regional protocol in terms to, to ensure consistency of approach across all uh, council areas in terms of planning and and uh, the workings of planning committees. Um, we will obviously. Um, you know, discuss with key stakeholders and take all comments on board in terms. Uh, it's of paramount importance to the Minister to ensure that there is consistency of approach in relation to planning yeah. and uh, when it, it transfers to Council. Yeah. Even now, there has always been complaints about inconsistencies between, you know, uh, planning officers, let alone in future with Councils. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What, no more questions for the team?
Um, yes, sorry. Ian. I raised it with um, Dr. Frawley this year. The compulsory, um, you know, training on standards. I think is what was the wording that he referred to. Um, I believe that that should be the case. That it should be compulsory, not just for the sake of it, but to protect, you know, councillors. Um, certainly in this new body, whether it be in the planning function or, or any other aspect of, of their, their role. Um, have you given much consideration to including it being compulsory or um, you know, what's your position at the minute? Uh, yes, I mean, it has been raised with us before um, and we're looking at ways of um, either through legislation or actually operationally through council procedure in terms of what councillors need to sign to, you know, to become a councillor that says, I, I know and understand and have, you know, have adopted the Code of Conduct. Um, so you know, we're, we're trying to weigh up either legislating for it or putting it into operational um, procedures, and we'll have to put that to the Minister. Because at the moment, um, as the bill stands, that there, isn't a, there isn't a statutory obligation for training for the, the Code of Conduct. The, the Code of Conduct is a statutory code. Um, so we're, we're considering that. Strengthen it. Yeah. Chair, just there's okay. one, one point, which is if you're looking at particularly the training, but I was I was in there. Um, I, I think in terms of the way people will interpret things at present, that there may be a bit of a gap, um, mm -hmm. which is obviously there's specific provisions in terms of, for instance, the planning side of it. There's also implications within some of that because some of those directly apply to the quasi-judicial type functions where it's licensing issue. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there are certain things which are. Uh, licensing is, is issued by councils already, so for example in terms of entertainment's licence, pub licence. People I think will make an assumption that, you know, I think most people will simply understand fairly easily the stuff, you know, as regards broader declarations of interest and all those type of things. That's fairly straightforward. They'll, they can, I think, with a bit of training, understand the planning stuff and the planning stuff won't come in immediately. If you have obviously then the stuff as regards to other quasi-judicial bits, because I, to take an, an example on it, uh, I think it would be fairly commonplace that if you've got issues around entertainment licences for pubs, and if you're, for example, as part of that saying that there will now be certain levels of restrictions on what can be said, what indications can be given of support or whatever, it would be fairly commonplace, I think, well, certainly from my locality, where you will have a number of pubs and clubs which are historically maybe have been built in the centre of residential areas or very close to residential areas. The councillors will get lobbied um, on occasions quite vigorously on particular aspects of that. Mm -hmm. And I think, as I said, while people probably can see, yes, there is something very different happening as regards planning, keep that in mind. I think unless there's very clear-cut training, people could very easily actually fall into a trap from what has, has been put, well, maybe a trap, but make a, a major mistake by way of, you know, you know, local residents complaining that well we don't actually want this general extension into the early hours of a Friday night or you know or Saturday morning whatever it happens to be on it uh, you, you know thinking that that's if you like a different category from planning in that sense on it so I, I certainly maybe just I think as you as you move ahead and that again maybe we'll make sure to make sure that's got got right but I think that's a key area also which I think that needs to be very clear cut early early training on because that from what I read of it although maybe a bit more less restricted than the pure planning stuff on it would be something that would kick in from day one, as opposed to, you know, yes. see sort of the, the devolution day. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure we'll see you soon. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Members, uh, next item. I'm aware of the time. We still have one more briefing coming. Um, so, yeah, very quickly, members. Um, there's a table to paper there uh, about a proposed uh, visit or further evidence sessions. Uh, members, we talked last time, um, or last week, about um, maybe extend, uh, uh, going to other jurisdictions um, to look at uh, other, uh, other practices. Um, so you have that tabled paper there from the Secretariat. Um, suggestions were made in the paper that we could uh, we could make a short visit uh, to GB at the end of January, uh, or we can do video conferencing from Parliament buildings, and or bringing in expert witnesses. 
Now, we are also thinking of perhaps we don't even need to maybe make the visit uh, by the end of January, because there's going to be a raft of guidance coming through. We could do this, do the visit after uh, January, after actually after we have made the report, after the committee stage to go out. Um, so that may not be so rushed. I know that last time I think there's a bit of, I think I, I sense that maybe there, is a, is, there isn't a lot of interest to try to, to cram this in by the end of January. There's two aspects clearly to the community planning stuff in particular. There's, there's what's on the face of the legislation. And certainly from the evidence we've got, there may well need to be some amendments yes. made, but I think they're relatively straightforward to be seen. But the meat of the, the committee planning is going to be on the guidance, the regulations, the implementation side, of it, which happens really post-legislation. And it, it might, there, there may be an argument as well that it may be more closer to that time whenever the minds are getting focused on that particular point, so that it's fresh in the minds on that, on that side. So we could go, say, February, March? April time. Uh, what do you think, question. members? So, and it seems to be quite a lot of uh, good practices that we could we could go and see, like in, in Scotland and Wales. Yeah, I'm not too sure about the suggestion on Odom. Um, I thought this more on racial grounds rather than the way we do things, more on kind of community division that uh, on that way. Uh, sectarian, yes, we, shall we, we name it? So it's kind of a bit of difference, I think, yeah. maybe not, not so relevant to us. But Scotland and Wales and quite a few councils that we could go and see and see how they do things. So members, should, would you agree to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you have any yeah. idea which subjects they want to explain? Any ideas what subject? I think Tom last time said you want to be wider rather than just looking at community uh, planning. Well, I think planning itself, Chair, is another big issue. Planning, yeah. It's brand, you know, it's, I'm not saying it's brand new to councils, but it's new to the, probably the range of councils now because it's quite a long time from planning powers. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know okay. I, mean? I, I think it's part of that because I think it will probably form part of the guidance. I, I agree with Tom. In relation to that, because uh, I mean, uh, clearly, both community planning and planning itself, both of those, there's a bit of a, a window of opportunity. Because if, if you're talking about planning, it won't actually be devolved until 2015. There's a bit of space there. Mm -hmm. But to answer in terms of, I think, I think in particular with the planning side of it, the changing role for a councillor. Now I know there's going to be a lot of training. That's going to be a real massive culture shock for a lot of councillors who see themselves as yeah. the local advocate. Yeah. And then essentially are going to find themselves, albeit with the power, but then in terms of public statements, their hands completely tied uh, on the subject. So yeah, I think that would be useful. But I mean, in t again, in terms of speed of, of action, it may not be massively needed all that all that quickly because it's 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 not going to happen just immediately in that regard. What about uh, making complaints, code of conduct, and you know the other uh, you know other um, jurisdictions how they deal with? Appeals, complaints, and we'll look at look at those as well. I think members, realistically, we could probably only go for a couple of days. You know that you know, given time constraint. Sure, so, I mean, it may yeah. also be purely as regards, and it, it may be useful to explore the issue. But as regards how appeals are dealt with under code, of, or particularly as regards that, that maybe might be in a slightly different position from. The other aspect is that was something that will have to probably be on the face of the bill. Mm. Now, having said that, I would have thought either <clears throat> by way of research or right. taking other evidence on that. You know, I'm not sure it would necessitate a visit. Maybe yeah. something to tie in yeah. when you have a visit, but that's actually something you will have to crack relatively quickly in that regard. Cause it will have to be in True. whatever amendments are there. Okay. okay. Although I thought um, Dr. Frawley for all these and these answers. Uh, has answered quite a lot of our queries anyway today. Um, okay, so sorry, which one? Oh, per yes, performance improvement. I think that's something we might want to see uh, from other other councils. Uh, there's Cardiff, Edinburgh as well. Yeah, 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 and Scotland. 
Yes, performance uh, improvement, monitoring of it and all that, and then community involvement. Mm -hmm. That would be the two, two major issues, one, and planning, three major issues. Okay, happy with that? Okay, members, we're moved on now. Then, uh, next one is a, a, a briefing. Uh, members, uh, the part, let's see, we have some papers there. We have at page 111 the departmental reply regarding climate change and energy funding. Uh, at page 114, we have departmental reply regarding European funding. And at page 116, uh, the OFM DFM correspondence regarding European Commission work program. And if I can uh, welcome Wesley Shannon, Director, Environmental Policy Division. Uh, Tim Irwin, uh, Tim, yes, uh, from Planning and Environment Policy Division as well. And Keith Brown, the Barrasso Task Force Climate Change and Energy Desk Officer. You're, you're all very welcome. Um, certainly, the committee has been quite interested in, in uh, you know, European funding sources, and I know we made complaint about one short letter you sent us. That just, I think, that's an indication of how interested we are, and you know, we certainly have heard from from others like CNCC saying that you know, there's money to be had, and are we doing our best to try to source those funding, and I think that that's an important point for us. Um, so, uh, if you want to, Wesley, you want to to. Uh, Talk to us first and then uh, answer questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm just conscious of your time, so I'll try and keep the opening bit brief, and then I'll obviously allow you opportunity for questions, which I suspect is probably of more interest to members. I just want to, I mean, uh, I'm here because technically I'm the chair of the Climate and Energy Thematic Group, which is part of the, the Barroso Task Force. Uh, I know that Tim and Keith were up. Uh, about a year ago to brief the committee. Now, obviously, some members are, are weren't on the committee at that stage, So, uh, uh, and there's obviously been various bits of correspondence that you've mentioned already. Um, so we're, we're here, obviously, very largely. Just to brief uh, you on the sort of progress since that period of time, and, and in some cases, just bring some members up to speed. I'm going to leave Tim and Keith to do most of the talking because they're the experts. And I just want to hand over at this stage maybe Keith, uh, to Tim, sorry, who will give a wee bit of back background again, more for the members that maybe missed the first time around, and then we can talk a bit more detail about what Keith's doing out in Brussels. Okay, um, <clears throat> just a, a two minute oversight of uh, our overview of the Brussels Task Force. It was originally set up in 2007, and its original remit was focused around the peace process. And then following a meeting between the First Minister and Deputy First Minister and the President Barroso, it was reinvigorated again in 2010. And uh, its remit was extended then to uh, broaden to, to cover improved engagement with Europe. And that was both policy and funding. Uh, and it was about using the Barroso connections to strengthen Northern Ireland's involvement in the European Union. At the same time, the Executive established a programme for government commitment, which was focused on the additional 20% drawdown of funding. Um, and that funding is competitive funding, and as highlighted in the research paper, it doesn't cover the structural funds. It's only the, the competitive funding element. Uh, so it's, it, it's principally around those that aren't part of the, um, the EU structural funds, the interreg funding, uh, only elements uh, B and C, and um, the uh, funding outside of the European Regional Development Fund and Social Funds. So to drive forward the Barroso agenda, there are four thematic groups established. And as Wesley has indicated, DOE lead on the climate and energy thematic group. And uh, in order to take those forward and, and engage as part of a network, uh, networking opportunity, uh, we established the four desk officer posts in Brussels, and Keith is our contact there. So uh, DOE also established a small Barroso team uh, in order to help scope out the work and uh, provide support to the thematic group and also to try and help uh, the department itself take forward opportunities for funding and uh, disseminate information back from Brussels to our networks. So uh, just since we were last here then, um, in terms of the progress that's been made, uh, we've held a number of events in order to help publicise European funding. We've worked with AFB and with InvestNI and Intertrade Ireland on a number of seminars and workshops to try and uh, encourage folk and inform them of what's coming down the pipeline. Uh, yes, we have. Yes, we've engaged with both universities and indeed with further education colleges. 
Uh, we had a Sustainable Energy Week uh, event in Brussels as well, where we actually showcased some of Northern Ireland's innovation and research uh, at two seminars on uh, sustainable energy. Um, and we had Wright Bus, we had McLaughlin and Harvey, we had Queen's and Quester, uh, a number of uh, the uh, uh, Belfast City Council as well, uh, all involved in showcasing what we do. And then most recently, um, in October, we held our Heads Up on Horizon 2020 uh, seminar and workshop. Again, this is just to um, provide uh, a lot of um, the latest and most up-to-date information at that stage on what was coming and give access to the new Horizon 2020 Northern Ireland contact points and to use Invest NI and Intertrade Ireland to inform people of what support there was in terms of grants uh, for helping people make connections in Brussels and for actually helping develop their proposals. So in terms of the network, we now have established a network of over 300 people uh, across the various sectors. Uh, we engage the departments with the councils, universities, further education colleges, SMEs, the whole, uh, whole range of sectors. We're also members of the Northern Ireland European Regional Forum, and that gives us access to a further network of contacts, and that's... And what's that? It's the forum that, which is headed up by Belfast City Council and OFMDFM, and it in, involves um, those with an interest in European funding across the, the board as well. Uh, over the course of our Barroso work, DOA supported eight successful EU-funded projects with a total value of €25.5 million, Euros, of which €3.5 million Euros, roughly is coming to Northern Ireland. Uh, and that support ranges from uh, provision of advice and guidance in terms of project development, QAing projects, uh, providing small amounts of match funding, and to actually uh, becoming assistant um, pro uh, sorry, um, partners or uh, full partners in some of the projects. Uh, and in terms of future work, um, we have learnt from the, the past year and a half and that there's a need to focus on those funds where we think we can make the most impact. And for us, the three that we'll be focusing on uh, over the, the next period of time will be Horizon 2020, Interreg 5, BNC, and also the, the life funding. And just uh, in terms of those three funds, um, the Horizon 2020 has a value of 70 billion euros. It's a, one of the biggest research and innovation funding packages. Um, the main purpose of that fund is to aid research and development and get products to market. So whilst the department itself might not be drawing down funding, it can certainly be helping support those that do wish to. In terms of the life funding, uh, that's one where uh, there are two, it's 1.8 billion in total, split between two, two streams, climate change and environment. And it's one which we are very interested in, and particularly the life integrated projects, which our colleagues in the Environment Agency are helping to pursue along with uh, the other devolved administrations as part of uh, the UK's projects. We're also uh, working with colleagues. We have one previous project, haven't we? We have one, sorry? One previous project and the life. Yes, that's right. Yes, uh, we had not. Yeah. Uh, we're coming from a very low base on all of this EU funding work. We recognise that and we're working to try and. Um, overcome that position, um, certainly in terms of... 1.4 million or something, was it? It was very, very low, very low. Uh, yeah. uh, in terms yeah. of what the Northern yeah. Ireland um, yeah. input was or drawdown was. Um, but we are now looking at uh, a number of life integrated projects with a potential value of between 10 and 50 million, and that would be split amongst the four devolved administrations. We're also working with colleagues down south to see whether we could work uh, an integrated project as part of the Republic's um, three allowable projects, so there's work going on in that sphere as well. Most of our success has been in terms of interreg projects to date, um, because those are the ones that we have been able to uh, provide a bit of support to. Um, and again, we'll be continuing to do that when interreg comes out uh, in May, I think it is. Um, well, it's later in 2014, uh, and we'll certainly be keeping our fingers uh, on the pulse for that one and looking at potential projects to take forward there. And um, that's just a run through, very, very brief. There's an awful lot of work has gone in behind the scenes to that, and more than happy to answer any questions on that. But maybe Keith will just give an update on the desk officer role and where that fits in. Good afternoon, folks. Um, I'm the climate and energy desk officer, so that would mean I would cover the remits of DOE, DETI, DRD, DARD, and DSD. Um, now, some of those departments are also involved in other thematic groups. 
um, so it's just sections of those departments, but it's mostly obviously going to be the environmental strand and the energy strand. Um, as well as supporting the departments in Brussels, uh, my role would also then support, extend to other organisations, be it NGOs, be it universities, um, the academic institutions, um, or some of the SMEs as well. We would also support, although obviously most of that is done through Invest NI. Uh, one thing that we've recently been uh, uh, had some success bringing to Brussels is the Northern Ireland Contact Point Network, which was set up by Deddy and Dell. And that was specifically to have people to support the Horizon 2020 funding process for the academic institutions and linking them with SMEs. Uh, in the start of December, for example, uh, when there was the information day by the Commission for the energy stream of Horizon 2020, we had uh, eight or nine different organisations brought out. Um, and myself and my colleague Invest and I, we would sit on the working group um, within a regional uh, network. Uh, helping to organise brokerage events, introduction events, uh, you know, project evaluation at the Brussels end. Um, so my work is mostly sort of facilitation from that side of things. Obviously, Tim's mentioned the team here doing an awful lot of work with the contact points now on the ground working here, and then I'd make maybe the final link for them in terms of regional partners or commission partners in Brussels. Uh, one of the other things I would do then is also sort of the early intelligence, trying to get details of funding streams before they're widely published, trying to get information on policy before it's widely published, um, chatting to the Commission officials to know what's coming down the line, chatting with my colleagues in UK rep and also in the Irish perm rep, um, and also in uh, some of the regional offices that would have a particular link to us or a particular interest in working with us. Um, and one of the sides of that is obviously then when we hold events, like uh, Tim mentioned, the a sustainable Energy Week event, um, where we held two workshops to show off, you know, regional excellence. Um, and one was on transport, and we had the right bus, new bus for London out of that, for example, which was a great draw. Um, and we also uh, held one more on general sort of energy efficiency work, which took in sort of the marine work, um, the likes of McLaughlin and Harvey, B9, and their energy storage work, and then the likes of Quest are falling out of the universities, um, and Belfast City Council as well. Uh, and I'd mentioned there I do some of the work on the policy side of things, um, and that's including that mostly that is passing the information back to the DOE. Um, but some of that also then lends itself in future to funding work. Um, there, there's recasts, for example, and things like the Water Framework Directive at the moment. And whereas there's not a fund for that specifically, when you go for water based funding in the future, say pollution control or energy efficiency, if you're not meeting the terms of the European priority, which is the framework directive, you don't get funding. So it's very important to make sure that you're in the same track in terms of policy. And for example, at the moment in the life bid, if it's related to the, you know, the rivers um, and runoff, for example, is one of the sections that's being looked at, that would mean we would need to have the water basin management plan in place, which we do, and that all adds to the fact, makes the, the whole application. We're doing very well, doing very well with that. Yeah, with the water basin management program. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't like to comment. Um, <laughs> the, uh, Tim had mentioned the sort of the, the uh, programs, and I'll not go into them in detail in case you want to ask questions. But the likes of Life, for example, will be worth roughly about 400 million euros per year for the next six years um, on the environmental side of things. Um, but it will also have a climate change aspect for the first time, and that can be anywhere between 80 and 150 million euros per year. Um, that will vary throughout the, the period. Um, on the um, Horizon 2020 side of things, it's uh, much broader this year for the first time, um, and the application is open for that on the 11th of December. And so organisations are encouraged to uh, come to Brussels and obviously apply. I mentioned the energy ones, for example. Um, when I return next week, we're having a brokerage event with our regional partners to go through various projects from the regions and try to identify which might be the strongest to push through. Um, on the 15th, uh, my colleague Invest and I, because I was over here, um, she was with the biotech side of things. Um, and we have a number of applications and possible projects from the likes of AFPI, for example, that we'll go through on the um, slightly environment side of that. The other big fund, which um, is not necessarily direct to DOE, but is in our group, is the CEF, um, which has replaced uh, the 10T you might have been aware of, and 10E and E10 in the past, which was the Trans-European Networks. Um, and the idea of this fund is that it's for the large infrastructure projects. It's about 30 billion euros, of which 5 uh, billion is on energy, about 1.5 on digital, and the rest is going to be on transport networks. And obviously DRD would be focused on, the, on one aspect, and Daddy would be strongly focused on the other. 
Um, just moving on quickly, uh, the, the one thing I would say is that I'm beginning to get a lot more engagement from people in Northern Ireland as the network here. And the, for example, every time after the workshop, yeah, you know, I would definitely know one's on because I get a lot of people suddenly coming to me and saying, can you help us with this? Can you get us contact that? Um, and sometimes it's the case, I will get the contact and then step out and they'll move forward with things. Um, and that's where the, the NICAP, the Northern Ireland Contact Point Network, has been very, very useful at taking that forward. Um, obviously, there's more work to do, more engagement, um, but uh, I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, and certainly, uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned, you all get to see my progress reports every quarter. Um, and if there's anything in there you have any questions about or wish to see push forward yourselves, you can obviously get in touch with the department. Um, or there is always the option, of course, if you want to make a visit to Brussels, I can put a programme together for you. It would be lovely to go to Brussels for a trip. Look at the, the new programmes and all that. I mean, how, how difficult is it for us as a region to try to get into the funding and the policy network? I mean, we're part of the UK, you know, one member state, but we're just a region. It depends from programme to programme and subject to subject. Um, in some cases, it's almost impossible. You know, you are knocking on a closed door. In other cases, you're welcomed in with open arms. Um, an example is in offshore wind, for example, at the moment, there has recently been the network we're in has set up a sub-working group on that. The Danish would lead on that. Um, they would be the sort of European leaders. And they're very enthusiastic about trying to get as many people in sort of the Atlant Atlantic periphery to get involved on that. So, you know, that's a case where people have come to us rather than us going to them. Um, on other issues, it's a case where we really need to push hard for Northern Ireland. Now, a lot of the policy work obviously should be really done through Whitehall in you know, because ultimately the UK is the position. Um, and negotiating between departments here, Department of Scotland, Wales, and in Whitehall will get the most equitable result. Because once it uh, goes to Brussels, the guys there in the UK rep are just pushing, you know, the UK position full stop. DRD did get a, a pretty good success, though, on the, um, to do with the 10T regulations, the transport regulations, because they, um, uh, one of the big aspects was about funding linked to electrified rail which obviously isn't an option here at the moment. And if the UK... It would be good if we have it. Well, eventually, yes. No <laughs> doubt it will be. But the, the UK, this wasn't an issue for them because obviously they're electrified in the main line already. Um, so DRD took representation to Whitehall, but also came out to Brussels, met with the Commission regularly, went to meet the commissioners, uh, went to attend council and so on, for example, and managed to get a derogation where it was removed from the regulation in the end. Now, that's a derogation that could save billions of pounds, ultimately. So, with a wee bit of dedication, it's certainly very, very possible to influence policy. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting what you said about we need to align ourselves to the policies and meeting the directives. Not having the Climate Change Act here in Northern Ireland, is it going to be a hindrance for us getting money? No. Um, climate change, uh, in terms of mitigation, is seen as subsidiarity, so it's up to each national government to do as they choose. Um, and there is a wide variation across Europe. Obviously, the UK has probably got the most advanced legislation on that. Some other countries will uh, make it clear they will only do what the European obligation is. Some have no interest in putting a bill in and would instead maybe have a strategy or an implementation plan about how it would work its priorities in. Um, some countries are still considering which way to go, obviously, but it will make no difference for funding because it's how you're aligned to the European priorities. And on the mitigation side, that's mostly through um, traded emissions in the EU emission trading system, or then again in your adaptation actions, which obviously you don't need a bill for as such. And we do have an adaptation program. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I let others come in. Cahill? Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much for your uh, presentation. Um, I have to say, maybe it's a case that we shouldn't go to Whitehall. <laughs> and that's not, that's not making a political call. And, um, I know that there's a lot of good funding out there, and you're, you're looking at the two separate programmes. In terms of, of programmes judged on their own merit, you should pick the ideal partner and go with that if you need a partner. So you know what I mean? So you know, others may argue a case if they want in relation to the Whitehall issue. But I know that in the twenty six counties they have drew down a lot of funding. Now I'm not saying they're better at it than anybody else, but I'm just using that as an example that there's been a lot of funding there. I think that's and, and that's my element on it, and I, I will keep continuing mentioning European funding till we get our fair share of it. And in some cases, we need to be looking at an island view on it, and what's best for ourselves. 
So, I mean, we just like that comment on some projects. <laughs> yes, sir. So, so, some encouraging projects that you've lined up so that I can yes, sir, get I mean, my next press statement. Yes, maybe. Yes, <laughs> yeah. It is one of the areas where we, we do recognise that uh, the South have done very, very well in terms of drawdown funds. We have met with um, Imelda Lampkin, who uh, heads up some of the European funding teams. And we've spoken to them about uh, engagement, and they're very, very keen to work with us on uh, European projects, particularly given this Barroso aspect, which is unique uh, to Northern Ireland and can help maybe project a, a sorry, very positive image. So uh, we are looking uh, with the South both in terms of the life integrated projects and in terms of a range of other projects. Um, and uh, a lot of the, um, the, the projects require you to uh, work with at least one other member state, if not two. So we're, we're very much aligned to, to working with the South. And the point you made uh, uh, is the, the picking the right partner. Mm -hmm. I think you said at the beginning, Raf, uh, that's exactly what we need to do, and that's what we've been trying to do with our network of contacts to, in encouraging the, the various potential partners. That can be either in the South or in Scotland or in Wales or whatever. The important thing is to get, and it can be other European nations as well, because we link with uh, more mainland countries as well and some, under some programmes. The important thing is that that's exactly what we, we need to do, is to try and make sure we have the right partner because as Tim and, and uh, Keith have both said there's a lot of money out there but it's very competitive to get at because it's spread across all of the countries uh, all of the member states so that we do need to you do need to pick your right partners and pick the right projects to try and increase your chances of success so that's exactly what we try to do and that's looking south looking east west it's there's a whole range of uh, options we're starting to make a note into and, but we need to get ahead of the game now in terms of, like Barossa has given us a unique opportunity here. Yeah. Um, and I would like to see over, especially over the next two years and in the rest of this mandate, that we get an opportunity to form partnerships, the proper partnerships, to deliver on this European Fund. You know, yes. And I don't know whether or not, how that extends down to obviously, whether there's an opportunity in local government because of the changes and everything that goes, I don't know whether there's a uniqueness in relation to that, but I would certainly like to see that. And I appreciate the reports, but um, when you can tie a project with a fee or a number at the end of it, yeah. certainly I'd be welcome on this committee to see exactly the progress that we're making. And Just on mentioning the councils there, the, the councils already do an awful lot of cross-border work, and we have been working with councils and border areas, who, and we've, we've had meetings with, with Louth County Council and so on as well about joining up on projects, um, and that is a, an important aspect. We've been, we've been to Derry City Council as well, and looking at the cross-border aspects too. Um, so we, we are trying to incorporate that as well as part of the package. No, agree, Dan. There's huge quantities of monies here available yeah. in yeah. Horizon 2020 and the, the life programme in terms of, obviously, we keep going back to climate action. And, but the environment, from the environment side of things, there's good opportunities there as well. But I, but I appreciate the presentation. Well, certainly, on, on that life point, uh, yeah. there are... <coughs> Colleagues in the Environment Agency are very keen to try and put together, an I think Tim mentioned, on, on the integrated projects. That's one of the emphasis coming from the, uh, the European Union. So they're looking to try and get a, a big integrated project developed. And so that, that, that that's very much on our horizon. Well, just, if you just one final, final point, Chair, because I mean, obviously there's a lot of R&D monies. Um, mm -hmm. I would be keen to try and find out in terms of support for small, I know it's not Generally, these programmes, these funding bodies, is not to give to businesses, but to support businesses in some way, maybe through. Well, there, are, there are support mechanisms. Intertrade Ireland provides some support mechanisms. Invest NI provide vouchers that allow you to, to uh, cover your cost of travel and accommodation, to, to go out to Brussels and meet partners. There is money available uh, for helping to prepare your project bid. Um, and we have been working to try and get that information out to across our network to SMEs, to uh, councils, to and say that you know, there there are support mechanisms here, and that was part of the the, the workshops that we held. We're bringing those people there. An open door policy now in terms of here to Europe, as opposed to maybe a closed door a couple of years ago. Well, that's much closed door as opposed to advertising, making people more aware, and the invitation that goes out. Well, it is in um, <coughs> under Horizon 2020, over the lifetime of the funds, 20% must go to SMEs. The take-up before was very low, obviously, because for an SME it's very hard to put together these proposals because there's the great risk that if it fails and you know only one in five are successful, that that's not necessarily the risk you take as an SME when you can go for, say, national funding or structural funding and grants and so on. So the fact that there's much more money now 
given to SMEs, there's going to be much more of a push to get involved. Yeah. Okay. You know, that ring fence, 20%, that would be good for Northern Ireland as well. Yeah. You know, with so many SMEs here. Yeah. Do you find people are tuning in to getting out to, to Europe? It's getting yeah, a lot. SMEs. Yeah, and it's getting a lot better. I think um, the support the Inter Trade and Invest NI has given obviously helps because then it's um, the, the big problem an awful lot of people have is to travel to Brussels is really a three-day event because we don't have a direct flight. So if you're travelling, you know, out of Dublin or via London or Amsterdam or Paris or whichever way, you know, you're essentially taking most of your day up and travelling there and back. So you're only getting one day of business for those three days. If you're obviously able to come for a week and get a whole lot of things packed in, that's very useful. And that's where we take part in, I mentioned the, the regional network that we're involved with. We try to set up brokerage events on certain dates to try and get everybody to come at once. And you know, that way it's, it's much more accessible, yeah. better use of time. Yeah, very much. Uh, Barry? Sorry. Chair, thank you. Um, it's in and around that last question, you know, about the level of engagement. Um, and I would ask, you know, perhaps the, the team to, Characterise, you know, the, the recent change in the level of engagement. You know, has it dramatically improved? Because there has been calls for, you know, a step change in the level of European engagement. And then, secondly, just interreg five B and C. Is there any particular character to that that we should know about? What is it looking for? Uh, well, uh, if we we'll go with the first one then uh, yeah. about the level of engagement. We have certainly seen an increase in the level of interest right across the department and through the Climate and Energy Thematic Group, which covers the other departments. We have a number of joined up projects. We've worked with DRD on the ECAR project, and that's drawn down some 10T money. We've worked with DARD and AFP on uh, research into air quality with biomass. Uh, we've worked across a, a number of departments in trying to put together projects. And we've worked with some of the councils. Councils are getting increasingly interested in coming to see us uh, about potential projects uh, and they're bringing with them not just their own council but the links they have to councils in the south and the links they have to SMEs and businesses in their area so it's providing a very useful way of getting information down that network and feeding back some of the, 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 uh, the thoughts they're having. Um, the the uh, second one in terms of Interreg 5 uh, A, B and C these are the, the, um, the transnational programs and cover things like the Atlantic area and the, the periphery, the West periphery program uh, projects and we have a couple of those running at the minute uh, working with Action Renewables and involving Spain, Portugal, Scotland, Ireland and ourselves um, and uh, we are looking at how we might take forward further projects whenever the Interreg 5 monies come out because this is one we see as a, another way that we can uh, work with partners who already have experience in this area and we're, we're basically building on their experience. Yeah, thank you. And one on, on, is it recycling? Or uh, we have uh, the um, sustainable energy uh, okay. community, renewable energy, which is about uh, going out to communities and encourage them to, to adopt renewable energies and energy efficiency. We have a battery project, which is about uh, intermodal transport using um, energy efficiency and uh, alternative fuels. Uh, and uh, we have Renew, uh, which is a, a waste uh, and recycling project. That be interesting to councils. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, very good. No more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Um, you. Would be useful for you to come back to us now and again. I'm really very interested in you know, looking at this issue. I think other members too. Okay. I mean, Chair, we can certainly, I mean, uh, we can arrange a briefing at any stage, you know, obviously a, it may be appropriate when there's a, I mean, a, maybe a degree of progress of some of the projects and some of the uh, project applications, but I'm certainly happy to, to come to the committee any time you want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, members, um, <coughs> we also, um, at page one, from page 116, is, um, OFM DFM letter to us in relation to um, the fact that they, they are doing a response. Is that right? Looking at European priorities for us. Mm -hmm. So, uh, members, um, are you, let me see, uh, if we ask the, ask the clerk maybe then to draft something mm -hmm. and bring it back. Uh, 
you know, based on, on the discussion uh, today uh, with the team and uh, see what, what priorities. Obviously, it, it would be on the environment, on climate change, energy, renewable energy, even wastes would be would be some. No, I don't mean even waste is actually a big a big issue, and um, waste management and all that would be our priorities. We haven't really discussed anything. We haven't discussed anything about waste, <laughs> <laughs> but we can just put down as one of our priorities. Right. Yeah, okay. you know, recycling, waste. Yeah, waste management. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, members, content with that? Okay. Next item, uh, correspondence. Uh, That's the suggested um, table on on actions. Uh, sorry, on the table of suggested actions. I mean, <laughs> at page one seven five there, and also at page one seven seven, you have the an invitation to attend. The afternoon session of the NUGA annual conference on the 27th of February. Um, we normally go to them kind of 11 o'clock or something and, and be involved in a panel discussion, but I think this time they're doing away with it. But in the afternoon, uh, they're inviting a number of people to come to talk to them about uh, reform with the uh, local government reform, so it could be interesting for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe if members could indicate, um, the staff would, I Let's think, go. email around information mm -hmm. and just ask members if they're interested to, to attend. Um, also tabled is an invitation from Roy Baggs uh, to an event uh, on, coming, on the coming Monday uh, regarding his scrap metal a dealer's is bill. That, is, that, is that a Roy for life, or is that? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Uh, so he, I think he's invited a number, a number of people, a number of people to come and and, and talk about legislation. So it will, it will be interesting if you can make the time. Okay, members, then. Um, let me see. Anything else? Well, if you're content to look at items 11.3 to 11.7, at pages 179 to 189. Agreed. Okay, agree. Work forward program is at page 191. Members content to look? Okay. Just, just to clarify, just on the, the work program, just in terms of uh, the day we're visiting Crawford's Burn, do we then have a meeting? Are we, are we lined up? Are we just simply going to go from here? Or is it a question of do we have somewhere local lined up? To meet and then sort of tie that in with the visitor. What, what's no, the process? I, I think we're just all going to go down there. It's about half three in the afternoon. Oh, I think yeah, everybody okay. just makes their That's own okay. way down That's to okay. it. Okay. How many have indicated to go? Um, this is the. Just just oh, a, I think Pam oh, just is me going. And, and, okay, and Peter. Uh -huh. That'll be three. three. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think that was just three. Yeah. 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 Is there other yeah. committee involved in that today? It's the Business Trust. Oh, it's the Business oh, right. Trust. Okay. That's right. And there is another committee as well. Which one? There is one other committee. Is it social development? No? Possibly in the housing aspect. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. There is one other committee, but it's primarily organised by the Business Trust. Yeah. Okay. So they all organise their own transport? Uh -huh. Just, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. On, on the okay. forward work programme next week, then, who are the presentations from? Is that worked out yet? Um, next week? Yeah. Yes, next week. Yeah. Belfast yeah. City Council yeah. asked if they could come and brief yeah. to outline how their situation is different from other councils yeah. in regards to the local government bill. Um, the department is then going to come along and make a formal response to the issues that are in the clause by clause tables, things that have been concerned. So, um, and then uh, call for evidence in the wind energy section. Is there anybody coming before us on that, or is that just a general? No, nobody's no. going to become. No. The, the call for evidence doesn't end until the 28th of February. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> the time didn't, you know, uh, to, we so that we we'll, we'll finish with the bill. And yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll yeah. formulate briefings at that point. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay, members, and then no other business, and then just uh, next meeting, same time, uh, Thursday, the 20th. 3rd of January in the Senate chamber. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no. yeah.